Dr. Bennett, hi, how are you? Hi, who am I speaking to? Okay. Hi, what is your name? Let me get my face on the camera. So you see my head, my head on the beach. Let me change the background first. Yes, to who was I speaking? Oh. Someone has a hand raised. How is everybody? You don't have to speak. You can always, if you want, you can speak later. If you don't want to, that's fine.
So, John, you have your hand up. Do you have a question? Assalamu alaikum, Doctor. Hello, Jafar. I like your background, Jafar. Thanks, Doctor. Uh, grateful for that. Yeah, let me put you on the screen there so other people can see it. There we go. Nice. Hey, welcome. Wait, I'm sorry, did you, what did you say, Jafar? Grateful for you, Dr. John. Oh, okay. You having a good time? This, this is a, yeah, this is a good tool. You'll, you will see, you will see. Yes, do you have a question? Oh, oh, so John, were you asking me, uh, did we were able to get you in there, so John, in the panel? No, you're in the panel, uh, Shafar, so you got in. Oh, so John's on the way in now. I, su I suppose his hand was raised because he couldn't get in. Hello, Doctor. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. This is Sajad. You got in okay. I would like to thank you for giving us this uh, opportunity to of learn course. from you. I would like to thank you. Of course. Welcome. You are my good father. Welcome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank Does you. that mean I have to buy your Christmas gift? Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> I would like to. I would like. I would like to be just like you in a, in the future, if okay. I could. Okay. Well, just participate and use this platform. It's it's it advances medicine. It advances you. It advances the community of Inshallah. neurosurgery. Of neurosurgery. Inshallah. Inshallah. Yeah. Yeah. If we can share and educate, it's a benefit to everybody. I am third. I am third stage in Al Mustansara University, College of Medicine. Oh, okay. Well, so, what year are you? Third stage. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I, I wish we could introduce everybody during the webcast. We, we could give people the option not to say anything, just to pass. Mm. But we can give people the option to say hi. Uh, my name is uh, Sajad Alush. I'm from Baghdad. I'm from Baghdad, yes. Yeah, I'm from I'm from the third, fourth year of school. We'll, we'll see if I can convince uh, uh, well, Samer to do that. Uh, keep my eyes peeled for Samer. I soon realized I wasn't cut out for that job. Hello, John. 
<laughs> so welcome. Oh, okay, Sammy, you're in there. Okay, Sam, let me look for you. Hi. Hi, Sam, you didn't get it. Hello, welcome. Hi. Hi. Do you hear me now? Yes. Uh, okay. How are, how are you? I'm fine. Good morning to everybody. Good morning to everybody. Morning. Okay. How nice uh, to to be with you in this uh, webinar. I call from France now. Oh, good. Yes. You know, we have French Grand Rounds. I'm in France uh, till uh, um, past a year. Okay. Maybe I continue my, my training in neurology at, um, at Montluçon. Oh, okay. Yes. Hello, Samer. Did you get in? Hello, John. Yeah, I am in. Oh, you got in. Okay. You change of scene. Uh, yeah. Well, either it's... that, you change your background. Yeah, it, it depends from where I'm talking. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so what's the plan? The same as yesterday? I just introduce you when you take it away, right? Okay. It's, uh, and uh, would you, uh, ah, you already invite. Oh, yeah, let me, me make you co host. And, and who else needs to be co host? Is any of you, you have anybody working with you or? Yeah, actually, yeah. Each each meeting at least there is uh, ten main players uh, regulating yeah. well, the. Tell me a few. I can let a few in anyway. It's a, to I, be I'm, a co host. I'm just checking. Uh, if oh, you can or... you can do that too. Yeah, you 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 can do it. Just do what yeah. you have to do. Do. Yeah, yeah. Let it. Let me know when you're ready. <laughs> um, I'm ready. Okay. Very good. Here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good afternoon from Miami Beach. This is the home of Neurosurgical TV. We have <clears throat> another webcast from uh, the mentorship program of Samra Hose, uh, MD. He's a neurosurgeon from Iraq, currently in Cincinnati. Uh, he's going to do an another mentorship session and I'll let him uh, tell you about it and take it away, Sam. Yeah, thank you, John. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, John, and thank you for the Neurosurgical TV to uh, give us this opportunity. Uh, this is uh, officially the fourth session of uh, our uh, ninth Neurosurgical uh, me uh, Mentorship. And um, uh, I'm already uh, happy with the responses of the previous meetings, and we are trying to uh, make it more and more interesting and more interactive. And we have a bunch of uh, things to discuss today. There will be uh, two, two, two different presentations, multiple videos as you like it from previous time. We have multiple video of different pathology, different surgeries, and point to discuss from that. Um, 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 hello, everybody, uh, to the panel, if anyone interested to uh, interact and to go through questions and to be part of the, uh, and, uh, of the interactive presentation, you are welcomed <clears throat> as, oh, sorry. As we always start, uh, I, I would uh, invite those who who are ready to uh, interact to raise a hand so I can, yeah, I can involve you in the uh, discussion. And uh, the first part will be a presentation about the basics of CT scan. Actually, this is a presentation that I like, uh, I give such presentation that, that I, I give the, the same presentation, the same, the same core uh, through the last maybe 10 or 11 years for any student uh, just 
this is the step one to to get and to understand what we do and on daily basis these are let's say the title will be the basics of the imaging and actually part of the uh, initial examination things that we need to discuss throughout uh, our cases i will try to give you now an introduction through this presentation, then we will go through some of the items that we prepared today. And after that, I am preparing a series of imaging just to make you uh, sure that you will have a consolidated knowledge about the neuroradiology. So this is just introduction. And after that, I think we prepare 200 uh, a slide just to be divided on lecture 50 through each lecture to discuss more and more about the radiology. You know, the neuroradiology is very important part. And in most instances all over the world, you have a huge part of the decision regarding the diagnosis. It, you, you cannot depend on the radiology report alone. You should have the uh, required knowledge and others to enable you to take action and at the same time to to have an interactive discussion with the radiologist uh, because you need something different in operative perspective you need something different in endovascular perspective and yeah so uh, the second the first part as the basic science is the anatomy the second part is the radiology and the third part is the operative technique so these in total are the basic science that you should study actually not basic it's the science pathway that you should go through uh, if you want to be a neurosurgeon or if you want to understand the neurosurgery so i have uh, six participants raised hand that's that's a good start um, i have some familial uh, faces i i will go with them also and there is also a new uh, participants so um, I will share my, my screen now and uh, just tell me when it's, um, okay. okay, perfect. Okay. So. This is the, um, I put it as number two because it's the, the two official, the second official presentation. And uh, actually I'm now still have two affiliation one in Baghdad still connected. And now I'm fellow in, in Cincinnati and uh, both places have given me a lot till now. And I'm, I have a huge gratitude. As I always say, uh, we are nothing without there is extra uh, voice, uh, John. Okay, so uh, we are we are uh, not in ourselves superior to our fathers. We are shameful inferior to them if we do not advance beyond them. And when you see a kid uh, image or kid picture, don't be very happy because this means there is a quiz. So. I, I will I will uh, ask you whenever I uh, I stop in a quiz and those who raise the hand uh, can answer just to make it more clear for others. And the, initially we are now trying to discuss what things that we should do and what things that we don't want to do uh, through uh, the basics of neurosurgery. The orientation is how to manage head injury or what are the requirement information that we need to manage head injury in the emergency for me. I think this is the priority. Spine injury, not the same acute management required for other lesion like tumors and other. It's less, in general, it's less acute process except some emergencies. But yeah, for the basics, you need to be fully oriented about head injury, how to manage head injury. So. Uh, first of all, I will ask myself and answer to give you information. We know there is a, a lot of different variation and level of understanding. So better to have a touch base and be, and a start for all. So for me, when I see this, I, I will say 
like I'm thinking loud now the like uh, I will start from outside to inside so the white area is the uh, is the brain uh, is is the bone is the skull then I go down to the gray area which is the brain and in, inside the brain I will see the dark black area which is the ventricle there is a, a number one point to put here that the ventricle is black however the air outside is also black and the difference between them is the clarity the the deep black area the clear black area is air whether it's outside the skull or in some instances inside the skull or maybe in the air sinuses in the future uh, these are uh, denote air uh, or sometimes pneumocephalus, aerosol, we call it when it's in, enter inside the brain, uh, while the CSF have a little bit more hazy uh, shadow within the black area. So, uh, and this is the cortex, this is the deep white matter of the brain, and these are also born, and I will call it uh, cal normal calcification. These are the common things that <clears throat> one can understand from day one in neurosurgery that these are the three most common uh, calcification that you find. It's spinal calcification. Usually there is more calcification here. Usually it's normal above age of 16. Below this age, it's suspicious, maybe a pathology. Uh, the choroid plexus calcification increase with age. The older the patient, the more calcification. The, the thickest choroid plexus is in the atrium of lateral ventricle. So uh, usually we call it the glomus area, and this is uh, the uh, the area that appear easy in CT scan. So this is normal calcification of choroid plexus, of posterior horn of lateral ventricle, and the pineal calcification. Uh, this, this, this is the skin, the thin rim outside, and this usually temporalis muscle. It's very important for me to see temporalis muscle bilateral for those who are beginner, because usually this is the color of hematoma. If you see the same color inside, so this is usually hematoma. And this is what we describe as the different uh, densities. Uh, from that, we can describe this as compared to the first one. So the first CT scan is normal CT scan. I'm still thinking uh, loud just to give you a full orientation for everybody. Like, the bone looks normal for me for the first look from outside. This is temporalis. I go inside. Definitely, there is an obvious abnormality here. It's by convex from both sides. There is a, a convexity on both sides. So this is an extra axial hematoma. Extra axial means outside the brain and pushing to the brain. The extra axial hematoma types are two. Either it's epidural hematoma or subdural hematoma. Epidural hematoma, it's easy. This uh, a typical example of epidural hematoma. Why? The answer is two points. The first is the biconvex lens shape. The number two is that the clear inner border. This clear inner border means that this blood push. Uh, I don't know if you see my pointer or not. Can I ask? Yeah, we can. Uh, we can see it. Okay. Okay. So, so, uh, so if the, the dura usually attached to the skull, so this clear margin give me, give me an idea that the blood here pushing the dura more and more deep until it's there. So this is definitely an epidural hematoma, and this is the brain pushed and the ventricle. As you see, the most important thing in ventricle is the symmetry. So there is a push in the ventricle. These are frontal horn, these are occipital horn. So, now, so here we can see that the frontal horn of the opposite side is just crossing the midline and the occipital horn is not there. This means that it may be pushed downward in another section because these are just axial. Uh, sections of the uh, cranium. And what other point to be added here is the midline. This midline here is very important. Any shift to the midline, this indicate an emergency because this may compress the brain and cause herniation. For those who, who, who know more, there is many herniation syndrome, but herniation means a life-threatening condition. For, for this case, this is a, a lesion compressing the brain and causing midline shift. If midline shift more than five millimeter, this is a significant midline shift and require treatment. For us, as a neurosurgeon, we are very 
good in treating this extra axial lesion for us this is the real emergency it's very easy if you think of it just open the skin or remove the bone section for the hematoma and it's done i mean the the basic principle for it and you are saving the life of patient this is very very good prognostic uh, surgery which is rare in, in neurosurgery in general but for epidural hematoma, it's very good prognosis. If, if anybody asks why, the answer is two, because it's outside the brain already. So it's not a lesion inside the brain. So the prog prognosis or the outcome will be good in general. And number two is that the presence of dura protects the brain. So it's not the blood distri distributed all over the place. These are the general. Other points, we'll go to, to it because the origin is arterial and due to fracture and whatever. Another example is that very clear. There is a difference in the density. I will take it. Talk, talk about it later, but let's go to the principle. This is the bone, and what's this? This is a clear air, simple, uh, similar to the outside. So this is air sinus. Basically, it's a frontal air sinus. I cannot see the ventricle clearly except this one a little bit. This means that there is a compression. Definitely, there is a midline shift. There is no cell side of the brain. So this is a type of brain edema, and the lesion is this extradural hematoma or epidural hematoma, we, we use this term interchangeably. And the usual classic history of that is that there is a direct trauma causing a fracture, and from fracture, the blood can go out and in, out causing a swelling in the scalp, and in pushing the dura, as we said, and forming epidural hematoma. And this is an example for, for it. The density, if you compare the last slide with this slide, there is a, a, a huge difference in density, many causes, but I want to put you in, in mind that maybe, maybe anemia is a factor for this patient as compared to other. Um, uh, there's many, many causes. Uh, as compared to that epidural hematoma, we have this, the subdural hematoma. I want you to focus on this slide. For me, this is the most important slide in this presentation. If you know a little bit about neurosurgery, this little bit should be at least extradural or epidural versus subdural, because these are the top emergency that we can treat it successfully. That's why this is very important. So if we, if we compare, number one, the shape will be a more semilunar in shape rather than biconvex. Number two, there is no clear margin of the dura for the epidural as compared with the subdural, the blood enter the cell side of the brain in the cortex. Number three is that the epidural is usually limited by the sutures in the, inside the skull, like the corona suture in this example, while here it's distributed all over the surface of the brain. It's not limited by the suture. Number four, which is very important if you compare to these two hematoma as an example this is very sizable hematoma we measure the hematoma by this thickness usually the skull thickness is six to eight millimeter and now you can compare if it's six millimeter this means that this is four cent centimeter at least or something like that while this it's more than one centimeter but if you compare their effect on the brain you can notice that this brain pushed more, even if it's a small hematoma. This is an important message and related to number two in the comparison, that here the dura hold the hematoma from pushing the brain more. While in subdural, there is no holding the, the hematoma pushing the brain, and you can see both ventricle clearly on the opposite side. This is very, very critical, very serious. A lesion to treat. Another point is the prognosis or outcome. As you remember, I said this is a good prognosis in general. This is actually in our text, it's put as excellent prognosis. While the subdural, there is the third role, like third is a good prognosis, third, there is death, and third, there is uh, like alive with a deficit or with disability. So it's not a good prognosis as compared to the epidural. And both of them, we call it acute because it's a fresh blood. If it's all the blood, it will be black. We call it at, at that example, chronic. So this is acute epidural hematoma. This is acute subdural hematoma. 
For the chronic type, there is very rare chronic epidural. It's not much uh, common. It's very, very rare. While the subdural, the chronic type also common, usually occur in the old age, and they come with the same shape, hematoma, but it's dark, not uh, uh, like this bright. So this is very important to compare. And if we go to this from that point, for me, this is the first question, the skull, uh, air sinus, and then we go inside, what's happening, there is pushing of the ventricle definitely, and there is a huge blood. If we can describe this blood, I will say this is blood inside the brain, not extra axial hematoma, as this previous example, there is nothing inside the brain, something from outside compressing. So these are extra axial hematoma, either epidural or subdural, while here it's intracerebral hematoma, and the updated name for it, it's intraparenchymal, because if, if it's inside the cerebellum, what you, how I call it intracerebral hematoma, and it's inside the cerebellum. So they put the name or the term intraparenchymal hematoma. However, like 90%, we use ICH. ICH means intracerebral hematoma. For those who use ICH, for just to put a term, there is ICH means intracranial hematoma. Intracranial hematoma is the term that includes all the types of hematoma inside the cranium. So in general, we don't use intracranial hematoma unless we are describing the whole, the whole categories of hematoma. Otherwise, when we say ICH, it means intracerebral, which means intraparenchymal. So this is intra, uh, the, this ICH is intracerebral hematoma. I think the position is the bit in, deep inside the brain, usually without signs of a trauma. If you compare with this one, for example, like the extra dura, there is a, a scalp hematoma outside. So this is a trauma. The, as a cause here, there is no trauma, usually old age present and have history of hypertension present with sudden deterioration, whether consciousness or weakness. And uh, what I should say that this is more like the spontaneous ICH. And if you notice the midline shift, surprisingly is less than the extra axial hematomas that we discussed in the previous slide. Why? Because it's inside the brain, so it's pressing in all direction. Also, you can notice there is a blood here uh, inside the ventricle. So this is the fourth type of, of hematoma out of five. And the, this is called the IVH or intraventricular hemorrhage or hematoma. Usually we call it hemorrhage. So for the IVH, I, I have a question for those who is raising their hand. Simple question, why the blood is in this side, not in this side, and both of them are ventricle. We say that this is frontal horn, this is occipital horn, so why the blood is here? Can I answer? Yeah, your name? Jafar Hassan Swage. From? Uh, so I'm from Najaf. I've recently graduated from Kufa Med School in my okay. city. So Najaf, Iraq. Yeah, yes. yeah Jafar. Well, simply put, uh, the patient is lying uh, supine on the CT scan bed. Okay, I, I would suggest to put it as a single term. What's the answer for this? Why blood is here? I will repeat the question. And it's in the dominant side. Again, I don't need a sentence. I need a single, <laughs> a single term. It's heavy. Gravity. Gravity, yeah, heavy and uh, uh, lying supine, it's the explanation. You are perfect, but for us, we need like just a spot diagnosis for everything to go through the presentation and also in real life, you need to summarize everything. There is a huge information. Uh, so it's a gravity, the patient lying on his back. So the blood is here. If the patient on the opposite side, you will see blood is here. And what's this? Anybody of the of those raising hand? The pineal blood gland cancel calcification. Pineal calcification. Yes, both of you are correct. And this is the choroid calcification. Here we cannot see it because at least it's pushed either down or up by the hematoma. Um, I would suggest uh, treatment for that, but at a later stage. I, we will discuss what are the options. So now we go to the fourth that we just mentioned, which is the intraventricular hemorrhage. And you can see the difference 
in this case, this is a pure intraventricular hemorrhage filling all the ventricle. From this slide, I usually describe the ventricular system because here is the frontal horns, here is the occipital horns, and the force for the first time, we can see the temporal horns. Temporal horns, usually two millimeter or less. So basically we say that it cannot be seen in CT. However, it can be as a minimum few uh, millimeter. But if you see this size of temporal horns, which means you are in a, in a lower section, this means that there is a dilated ventricular system. One of the solid sign of hydrocephalus is the dilated temporal horn. So no, not every dilated vent ventricle, because these are dilated, but I cannot say this is a hydrocephalus for the first example. Well, the second example, the, those are, I can say hydrocephalus because there is bilateral dilated temporal horn. It goes more with hydrocephalus, so I can describe it more hydrocephalus. Still, if you, if you listen to me, I say more because it's still relative. I cannot swear 100% until I follow the patient. However, what, what are the other solid signs that if I combined bilateral temporal horn dilatation and it's not related to filling by blood or not, I mean only the size, but this filling of blood give us the clear idea about the size. So bilateral temporal horn dilat dilatation plus bilateral frontal horn dilatation, which is not there, but if there is bilateral frontal also, this is, I can say 100%, this is hydrocephalus. Not, this is not simply a dilated ventricle, but the frontal horn is not dilated maybe yet, maybe at a few hours later, it will be dilated. We will see. And the most important is this one, is the third ventricle, which is a midline slit at the level of lateral ventricle. It's not more high, it's not more down, it's very small. A midline slit usually just a thin line, but now it's dilated and filled with the blood. So this is also a sign of hydrocephalus. We call it ballooning of third ventricle. And this is very solid sign. And the, four, uh, and the fourth ventricle should be starting from this. This may be the end of cervical duct and should be in the posterior fossa. It's not in this slide, but I will go through it. Here, as an, a summary, there is a frontal horn, occipital horn, and there is temporal horn. This is for the lateral ventricle, which means the ventricle that is located in the hemispheres, while the midline contain one of two only, either the third ventricle up or the fourth ventricle down, which is very small, and usually it's in the lower section. I will show you later. Let's continue. And yeah, this is the fifth and the final type of hematoma, and we call it a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which means the blood below the dura. However, it's all even below the arachnoid. And this uh, 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 gives the blood access to go deep inside the cell side. And this is the typical, this is the subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is a subarachnoid hemorrhage in the interhemispheric fissure and going through cell site. And this is also a subarachnoid hemorrhage because it's go deep and this is the sylvian fissure. So all these forms are subarachnoid hemorrhage. If interestingly, if you see these two form like the IVH and this SIH, which is the subarachnoid, both of them has basically has no midline shift. Why? Obviously, because the lesion is distributed all over the place, and that's why it's not compressing. This means, management-wise, for all, all the three cases, I can say it's not the top emergency as compared to previous slide of epidural and subdural. I hope this is, this is clear. I will now go through just some example to test our knowledge. This is just the, the things that I have uh, in mind that I want to have it in mind just readily. Now, just an example, I will go and ask uh, Mustafa Jabari, Nicola, two of you only, can you describe anyone, what, what, what you are seeing? Uh, hello, everyone. Is my voice clear? Yeah, yeah, Mustafa. Okay. Uh, hello, Dr. Samar. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mustafa Hikmat Jabari from, uh, from Baghdad, Iraq. Uh, I just graduated from... Uh, Baghdad College of Medicine. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, I can see now, right now, uh, a hyperdense lesion, central hyperdense lesion inside the parenchyma uh, of the brain. Uh, of the brain. Do, do you remember my comment on Jaffer? Uh, 
No. <laughs> I need a term first. If I agree, oh, so. then, then we, we can go to the description. Uh, uh, like, uh, how, uh, how can I give you a, a, a one term? Like intraparenchymal hemorrhage, that's it? Okay. As definitely, you are true. This is mm -hmm. ICH, but it's a different shape, ICH. It's longitudinal. Why it's longitudinal? Uh, maybe depend the, uh, on the mechanism of the injury, I think. Yeah. One term. What do you what do you suspect as a mechanism? Do you have think also, uh, Nicola? Do you have think in mind? Yeah, is it trauma? Is it a traumatic uh, intracerebral hemorrhage? Because uh, yeah. I, I can see the swelling outside of the school. In uh, what do you suggest as a mechanism for both of you? What's the term as a mechanism? Can, uh, I, I, I think I remember something like acceleration, deceleration, something like that. No. Or, okay. Ah. I, I will I will I will ask you a, a leading question. Is that a, a trauma to the head or there is something enter the head? I mean, it's a closed hematoma, just a concussion of the brain, just something hitting the brain from outside, or there is something go through the brain and causing this hematoma. What do you think? Yes, I think there is something from outside and. Uh, moving throughout the, the pathway. Okay, all all of those raising hand. Do you have a term as an as a suggestive answer for this? Yes, doctor. Yes. Uh, Mohammed Mohammed Emara. Yeah. Yes, I'm a first year medical student at University of Sharjah. I think it's a gunshot wound. Perfect. So now it's a gunshot wound. I would suggest this is something good to have in mind then try to analyze it if i go with with, the, with what mustafa described it's correct it's an ich which we say that intracerebral hematoma but i will use it from now it's only ich so but we call it a tract hematoma so obviously there is a tract and nicola uh, there is a swelling from both sides uh i think there is a voice yeah, please keep your, yourself a mute. Uh, uh, so uh, this is an ICH, uh, intracerebral hematoma, but we call it a tract hematoma because usually it's a tract of penetrating injury from side to side. And you can see there is a wound here and wound here, as, as Nicola described, and causing hematoma in the way, as Mustafa said. So it goes with what Mohammed described as a penetrating bullet injury. Now, the, the next question, which is very important, uh, and I confirm, by the way, this is a bullet injury from side to side. So the next question, is it from this side? Because this is the left of the CT and this is the right. So it's from left to right or from right to left. What do you expect based on what we see? Any idea? Answer? Okay. Uh Maybe I, I will depend uh, on the shifting of the brain. So I think it's from the left to the right. That's interesting. From the shifting, I will say from left to right. Thank you, Mustafa. Another answer. Any other opinion? Anybody can have different opinion from Mustafa? Um, it could be from the right to the left because um, it looks like it's going upwards. And there's a second exit wound on the left side, and there's also bony or calcifications. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry. <laughs> Two points. First, this is Osama from Bahrain. I, I, I think yes. we, we already know we know Osama because you are very active, and that's good. And number two is that what is the term that I want to hear? There's a there is essay. Usually, the answer is not essay in neurosurgery. <laughs> um, and, exit wound. <laughs> So you, you are describing it's it's not from left to right, as most of us say, it's from right to left because what's the cause? Um, so my first point is that on the left side, there's an main point. Wound. What's the main point? Yeah. Let, let, let me put it in that direction. What's the main point in your mind? That um, it's from point, right to left. Um, the collection or the hematoma. Where? Uh, there's a larger hematoma on the left side compared to the right. Okay, that, that's interesting. It's from right to left because the hematoma on this left side is more. That's interesting. And yes, you have, you, have one, one, you have one more. Yeah. 
Yeah. Say, um, say it. There's also like calcifications on their right side. Um, could be from the bony speculoids um, from the gunshot wood entry. That's that's interesting that there is maybe a bone. We call it, by, by the way, you are correct. And we call it a bone chips. Okay. Uh, which means bone fragment that go when the bullet enter. So you you now your answers, both of you are, are very nice just because we are thinking together. So you are correct. Sometimes we depend on the shift. Sometimes we depend on the size of hematoma. But for me, the last point is the only part of the real answer that uh, these bone chips is indicating that the bullet is entering from here. So these are inside. It's something like, do, do you know where is like when there is a crime and there is a smashed window? If you see the glass outside the room, this means that some, somebody going from inside to outside because the glass is outside. So it's the same thing. And for the same point, if you see this, this is also a bone fragment. And why it's out? It's out because the, this is the exit of bullet. So we call it, this is a type of penetrating. This means that the bullet enter the, the brain. Perforating means, means that there is in and out. Sometimes you call it in and out injury, sometimes perforating, sometimes just through and through injury, okay? And in this type of injury, you will not see the bullet in the, in the skull. Uh, so the first sign is the bone. The second sign I would suggest, which I think you can study it in the college, is that the size of the wound. Usually the in entry is very small wound, usually not noticeable, and the exit wound, usually the largest wound. This is like part of your forensic class in the, in the college in general, in medical college. And what I should add here before I go to other slides is that for a surgery, we don't evacuate hematoma. For a surgery, we don't go to the inlet. For a surgery, we usually try to go to the outlet, clean it, and repair the dura. This is the most important for us. And what we do with the hematoma, we just do a wash, just a saline wash. If there is a hematoma that exit with the wash, okay. If otherwise, I will not go searching for every spot of the blood because it, it will go with the time. The most important, I will decompress the exit and I will clean the exit. And, the, and at the top, I should close the dura because there is a, uh, there is one of the highest risk of bullet. If the, if the patient is still alive, the, the major complication that we are afraid of is the CSF leak and the infection and the abscess. This is the, usually the most common cause of later deterioration and death. So that's the general idea. And by the way, you can see these spots. These are air, air inside the skull, basically because of the bullet. And we call it here either aerosol or pneumocephalus, it's up to you. And last thing you can notice, it's a minimal shift as compared to this huge injury, it's minimal shift. The answer, why? Because it's bilateral. So you do not expect a midline shift in a bullet injury. Uh, and this is a frontal air sinus. Thank you, thank you for this. And I will go to this one. What's the difference? What's this one in one term? Artifact, uh, metal artifact. Metal artifact. That's good, but this is also an explanation. What do you think that the, this patient have? Um, he could have aneurysm clippings, possibly. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you, are, you are right. Actually, you are answering the difficult question. I will go to the simple question. This is a penetrating bullet injury. Uh, uh, Basically, because there is no uh, um, there is no coiling in this area usually, and basically because let's say if it's a case scenario, it starts with a history of trauma. Okay, so maybe this is my side of the question. If I we are discussing more a trauma, as I said in the beginning of this presentation. So if we comparing these in the setting of trauma. Yeah, this is the penetrating type of injury. The difference between perforating and penetrating, I think it's very clear now. And uh, penetrating means the bullet stay inside and this maybe fragmentation of the bullet because, because you can see there is 
multiple pieces. And the most important, what we call this, we call it metallic artifact, as Osama said. And maybe if it's only radiology examination without case scenario, you are perfectly correct that any implantation inside the skull may appear with this metallic artifact, let's say coil, as you said. Um, that, that's important slide to have. And now we have another quiz. Just, I want to ask new people. Thank you, Osama. Thank you, Mohammed. And uh, let's ask Arwa. Are you there? And Mohammed Saad. Are you ready? Both of you? Yes, I'm ready. For the next four slides, I will ask you. I will ask both of you. So, just a spot diagnosis. What's this? Um, I believe it's a subdural hematoma. Okay, you are you are correct. And I will add: if I am a resident in the exam, I will answer in the following because now you answer me uh, subdural hematoma, which is correct. Now let's go get to more detail a little bit detail just to make it perfect if i am a resident and i'm in the exam i will say there is a acute subdural hematoma exactly on the on the left side of the frontal and parietal lobe compressing the brain causing midline shift and press pressing the ventricle to the opposite side and causing cerebral edema because if you can notice that this hemisphere has no cell side as compared to the other side this this will be like the full question that you should mention, the midline shift, the compression of ventricle, the edema, and maybe we can add the size because the next question in the, let's say in residency exam, they will ask you, do you think this is a significant hematoma or not? Because there is a, like a, something you should, you should have, you should study that what's, what's the thickness of hematoma that requires surgery. Because interestingly for you as a medical student, now you will you will study this like epidural and subdural and surgery and how to do the surgery. But once you are a resident, you will face with the first fact: not only not every epidural requires surgery, not every subdural requires surgery. Simply, if it's a thin one like this part only, I will not do surgery. It will not be a significant change after the surgery. Do you get my point? Yes. Like if if I if if this is the thickness, I will evacuate this. What's the difference? It's not difference. This is the difference. This is number one. Number two, the chronicity. If I have if I have this hematoma with a patient injury history three years uh, three days ago, sorry, three days ago, and the patient is fully conscious, has no deficit, I will wait. I will wait a little bit. I will not go to surgery direct. I will follow up. Uh, the patient clinically, and I will repeat the CT scan maybe in six or 12 hours. It depends. So this is very good just to have the experience that this is more than the medical school, that there is a, a, a certain factor that govern the decision. It's not direct indication or not. So yeah. for this- Can I add for, something, please? Yeah, after I complete the last okay, point <laughs> of the description. So the, the thickness is part of it. For subdural, it de depend on pediatric or adult. For epidural, it depend on pediatric or on adult. In general, more than one centimeter thickness is a significant, but in reality, there is uh, uh, more than uh, 15 millimeter at least to have a real significant hematoma. And it should be like in the middle. If it's a frontal only, occipital only, usually not causing shift and not an urgent surgery. I, I'm listening to you, Mohammed. Yeah. Try to summarize. Uh, I want to go to the next slide. Don't okay. skip your exam. <laughs> so basically, I believe we can add another thing that uh, it depends on the location of the hematoma. Uh, I think temporal hematoma is the most dangerous uh, types. That, that that's that's my point. Like if it's a frontal only or occipital only, yeah. it's different from uh, temporal or posterior fossa. There is a role in neurosurgery. You don't sleep, and the patient have temporal hematoma, whatever the size. Okay, because it can okay. in, increase in size at, at any time, and you will not have the time to follow and do the surgery if the patient all of a sudden have just uh, uh, decrease de deteriorate sudden deterioration. Still with Arwa and Mohammed, what do you see? Without, I believe. 
Mohammed. Uh, <laughs> basically, I think. Uh, now I think. Yeah, I, I need okay, to uh, that. I think. Um, sub arachid uh, arachidonic hematoma. Okay, are are you there? Do you have any suggestions? You hear me? Uh, okay, maybe there is a problem with the voice. I will take another Naba. Are you ready? Naba, do you hear me? There is many Muhammad. Okay. Um, Taha? Yes, doctor. I'm Taha. Uh, I'm a third year medical student at the University of Baghdad, Iraq. And um, I think that's um, subacute um, extradural hematoma. Okay. This is very nice, but I don't like it. Like, this uh... is, let me tell you why. You, you are perfectly correct. But just for teaching purposes, I will tell you next time, say, this is epidural hematoma. Why? Oh, wow. Because okay. because, <laughs> because your colleague said that this is subarachnoid. So when we are saying that this is a subarachnoid and the other one suggests another option, usually say epidural. Don't go to subacute or whatever, okay? Because mm -hmm. the point is that there is a huge difference in the diagnosis. So it's either subarachnoid or epidural don't focus on details at the time that you must take a huge decision because epidural means we should go to the surgery now subarachnoid means there is no need for urgent surgery do you do you know, get my point yeah, yeah, so yeah. The, the details are very nice you are very oriented however actually i don't like the sub sub uh, acute because i told you before that Epidural hematoma usually acute, and for me this is acute, not subacute, and maybe the patient have anemia. Maybe simply there is a CT scan contrast change that you can increase the uh, the darkness and the brightness. Sometimes it's just uh, technical issues. Mm -hmm. And what what I have to say that for Taha and was the other one answering me before? Uh, it's me, Muhammad Saad. Okay, Muhammad. So. The, my answer now that both of you are correct, that this is a subarachnoid hemorrhage in the hemisphere, and this is the epidural, and both of you are correct. However, there is even a depressive fracture in the frontal air sinus. If you see there is hematoma and there is a fracture here, there is blood in the sinus, usually the sinus only black area. This is a blood. So we have multiple diagnoses. And also there is this tiny blood area in the brain. This is like ICH, but when the ICH is very small, less than one centimeter, and there is multiple, we call it contusions. So for a diagnosis, I will put epidural hematoma, contusions, multiple frontal contusion, and subarachnoid hemorrhage, and there is depressive front depressive fracture for the uh, frontal air sinus. As a treatment, I will say you are correct if you say epidural first. If you say anything before epidural, this means for me, it's not the correct answer. You should recognize this because this is a temporal epidural hematoma. I will go to surgery. I evacuate this and then decide to do surgery or not for this part. For me, I think this deserves surgery. Yeah. But if there is no epidural hematoma, I will do this surgery maybe next day. If, because of this hematoma, I will do the surgery within four to six hours or maybe two hours. Okay. And by the way, this is the fourth ventricle sitting in the posterior fossa. Usually the bone is more here and from side to other. This is just simply because the patient is, head is oblique. And for me, it's very important to recognize that this is a hematoma type, while this is a just a, a oblique cut of the bone because the color, because some people can see this and maybe this is a hemat other hematoma. No, because the color. And what's this? This is air inside the bone. So it's sinus. What's, what's the sinus here? It's the mastoid air cells. I will go with Taha and Mohammed Saad for the next slide. Uh, not this, the next one, but this is just to confirm that 
yeah, again, this is the most important, epidural versus subdural, or this is the subdural, this is the epidural hematoma. Um, and these are the classic teaching, what they, what we should teach you, we should start from this, like the cause of epidural hematoma. I don't like that from the first start. Like now, after recognizing the difference and the significance of each one, now, yeah, let's go to the details. And usually the, there is a fracture in the bone and the hematoma below fracture, and there is a dura and biconvex. So this is uh, and arterial origin. So this is epidural, while the subdural, the trauma usually from the other side and the patient, the brain just shaken and there is cutting in the veins that that like hanging the brain and we call it the bridging vein. So it's venous origin while here, here is arterial. This is direct trauma while this usually counter coup injury. Uh, and this is uh, more venous and we say that it's uh, not a lens, it's a uh, semilunar in shape. And yeah, sometimes the teaching is simple like that. We need all this. Like for a for a resident, you need all the types of mnemonics just to make it more interesting, even like this. Okay, I will accept it. It's lemon shape or banana shape, whatever. At least you should recognize it. Uh, in neurosurgery, as a resident, you need to be a practical. You need uh, uh, I'm just to be more practical and ready to have the patient uh understanding and even like in in movies and in, in series and tv series the like a neurosurgeon usually more serious what i say uh, what i would like to say to my resident from their start i even sometimes the student that working with me i will give them the advice in this way that if i have my relative like my parent having a blood from the head due to brain injury and I'm rushing in the in the OR. I want someone who's serious and ready to help me under understand me, understanding me, rather than just to say, okay, let me take history, let me have through what are the relevant signs in examination. No, there is no time for this. And in preparation, you should prepare for the worst. And the worst is the top emergency. Another point is that the same importance is the initial assessment. Is that patient, I should walk with the patient and is the priority, I leave all others and go with this patient because life-saving or not. The decision mainly based on GCS, which is the Glasgow Coma Scale. And it's like 40 years and it's not changed. It's very valid and we can use it uh, like hundreds, uh, hundred times every week, but in general, you can you can study this. I I will always insist on that. I'm not teaching you the neurosurgery from zero. I'm just giving you an idea on how to study and the most important. What are the significance of study? Uh, and uh, we have three parameter: uh, motor, eye, uh, verbal. Those who are raising your hand, the, the hands. What's the most important one of them? If I want to choose one. Can I answer? Eye opening. Eye opening, yeah. Yeah, Who's, who, say, who says the eye opening? Muhammad Amor. Okay, Muhammad. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, uh, no, simply because there is sometimes in head injury, there is swelling of the eye. The patient cannot uh, open his eye. However, where is the patient? It's not there, he's in the WC. He's walking already, you know? So if, if the patient cannot open his eye, this means it's not a, a deep coma. You get my point? So it is an additive. However, it's not the most important. Uh, I will not go through more question, but yeah, you, you give me the point because this is like the majority of people thinking that he opened his eye, so he's good. Yeah, but this is just sim too simplify simplified. The most important is that the motor and Mohammed, if, if if you are the resident and I'm the surgeon of, of or if we both are resident, we will communicate basically with the motor. Okay, so uh, do you hear me, Mohammed? Yes. Yeah. So so if I told you that the patient is obeying command, that's it. He's obeying command. He's talking. If I say you that the patient is flat, which means GCS three. This means a different scenario. That's it. 
I don't need to know he's talking or not or opening his eye or not. So basically, the, we use the Glasgow to communicate and to compare the patient case if it's deteriorated or improved, it depends on the number of GCS. However, the, in the solid core of neurosurgery, you know that we usually communicate with the motor. Or let's say, I, I want to uh, emphasize this, Mohammed. If, if I told you that the patient, uh, this patient has GCS 12, while, while this patient has GCS 10, for me as a neurosurgeon, I need to know more about that. Like the 10 or 12 is very similar. I want to see them M. If, the, if, if it's 10 and the motor is six, this patient is very good prognosis. But if the 10 means that the M is four, let's say, there is a huge difference. Four M means a, a poor prognosis in general. Four, three, two, uh, sorry, three, uh, four is very poor prognosis, even lower, two and one. So that, that's the difference. I mean, uh, uh, to, to make a conclusion, Use GCS, which is the best one to 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 come to assess the patient condition, and most important importantly, to communicate with others. And the second point, the motor response is the most important. And the last point I want to say here about the GCS is that um, for motor, OB command six, localized five, flexion. Four, we, we call it withdrawal, abnormal flexion three, and two for extension, it's abnormal uh, movement. And when there is no movement, it's flaccid. The eye opening is of four, either no or to pain or to voice or, or spontaneous. And the verbal is either no or just sound or just word or there is sentence, but incomprehensive. And the fifth is the comprehensive. However, uh, the, what the thing I want to put in mind is this eight number. Uh, GCS below eight, usually poor prognosis. GCS above eight, usually good prognosis. I mean, GCS below eight is an indication for uh, admission to the intensive care, just to put it in mind. That's the difference. GCS, the lower is a three. We call it flat or, or brain death. Actually, brain death, even sometimes four and five is a brain death. Uh, that's, that's the main point of GCS. And now, um, I will make this simple just for you. Like the, the hand above is the doctor hand. Usually you put the pain at many sites. I don't want to discuss, but if you make the pressure here, there is a pain, the patient hold his hand and localize the site. So this is five. If he cannot reach, this is four. If he cannot reach and it's abnormal flexion, so this is three. And if he move his hand on the opposite direction, like down, so this is like two. And another test. Yeah, who knows what's the abnormality in this patient? One, two, three, four, five. Done. Any idea? I will answer. IBH. Um, IBH. The, the answer is normal. A delay in the diagnosis of a delay in finding a, a diagnosis is an answer usually. So this is a normal patient. What what uh, what I will answer as. Uh, the 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 person who said IVH, I, I will lead you through this. Like as a as a surgeon, as a resident, how I should have like a three three second decision. However, actually, it's a three second idea for me. I will go through all slides. I will go through all section from above to down, and I will never go through CT scan without seeing the patient. Because if the patient has swelling in the frontal, I should looking. I should look below the swelling, and usually I can't find a, a fracture even if it's very small. That's that's very important to correlate the patient condition with the CT scan. If the patient fully conscious, has no history of trauma, doing CT scan for headache, sometimes I found something abnormal, like a calcification or lesion, but I will consider it normal and I will ask the patient to follow and do MRI later. That, that's very important to correlate with the clinical. However, for, for you, I will say the following. This is a CT scan. 
midline shift no i uh, ventricle not pushed for me this is a normal ct scan I, I i would say a normal ct scan from a neurosurgical perspective like there is no something urgent there is no something big basically then i will go through the section in this direction i will look in 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 that direction searching for any possible hematoma in the angle and at the end, I will go through posterior fossa and checking if there is maybe hydrocephalus. So the, the most important is there is no shift. The ventricle are symmetrical bilateral and there is no extra axial hematoma. So basically, this is the main signs, uh, main signs that I can say, okay, basically it's a normal CT scan. For us, we cannot say it's a normal, never. We usually put it, the CT scan show no significant lesion. And you understand, okay, <laughs> they can, uh, because you don't know the patient 100%. It's just an instant decision. For me, I will say that there is no indication for a neurosurgical intervention in this patient. That's it. This is just to compare, like, how clear if there is any pathology. This is IVH, ICH from second to three. That's it. Then we go to the detail. Where is the IVH? Where is the ICH? What I will do? But from the first look, this. Next time, you will say IVH, ICH, or ICH, IVH. Usually, ICH rupture as a part of it into the ventricle and causing IVH. And if the ICH has an IVH with it, this gives a more poor prognosis, just to give you an idea. Uh, what's the G GCS? Motor is two. Uh, two? Who said the motor is two? Uh, Hamid. Yeah, we have we have many Muhammad. Muhammad Al Sandu. Uh, Muhammad Al Sandu. No. Yes. Can you introduce yourself? Because this is like. Uh, my name is Muhammad uh, from Iraq, Baghdad, in Muslim Syria University for fourth stage. Okay. Uh, so, Muhammad, you said the motor is two, it's which two. means uh, you, you are per perfectly correct. This is extension. Yeah. And yes. what I would add that for motor three and two, which is the abnormal flexion and extension, both of them, you will have an extension of lower limb. So for me, if I see the patient, even in the, in the like they are bringing the patient, before I see the patient, when I see the patient from a far distance, for me, this is very serious. I will leave everything, I will go direct to this patient. This is very important. It's not always, it's not 100%, but better to have these clues in mind that, this is extension from the hand and confirmed by lower limb extension. And as I said that for uh, M2 and 3, both of them, you will have lower limb extension. Uh, better to understand our patient. I, I will say this, that <laughs> you must understand your patient. That's particular for neurosurgery, by the way, all over the world. What's the point is that sometimes you just get or arrogant with the patient and you feel he's not polite, okay? But you, if you are the resident in the emergency, you should keep maximum patience. Why? Because your patient can have seizure like in a second. When the patient will have a seizure, you will have the worst day in your life. Like after you say like, you should talk in a better way. Uh, I, just don't uh, make me busy, wait, and I will manage you. Sometimes you can say this to a patient. <laughs> and yeah, but for a neurosurgical patient with head injury in the emergency, please don't say it. Because if the patient has seizure, all of a sudden you will be in the worst position. Or sometimes there is a loss of consciousness. There's sudden loss of consciousness due to enlarging hematoma. So the patient is just have a small extradural. You say, okay, stay calm, stable. We will follow you. And the patient and the family keep nagging on you and uh, asking hundreds of questions. Maybe you reach a, a, a limit that you say, okay, don't ask me again or whatever response, but at least it's a little aggressive response. Keep this in mind that this hematoma that you see it, it's a simple case, can enlarge at any time and you will be in a serious condition, at least ethically. Like sometimes very, sim very simple cases, yeah, you need to take the decision you, you need. Don't waste time with the very simple cases. But for head injury, 
neurosurgery, just remember this in your mind. Seizure can occur at any time. Hematoma can increase in, in, in size at any time. You must be the most <laughs> patient person in the world, whatever the, the response. For me, I told you before, like I have a practice in Iraq. I have a training in Turkey. I have a training in Japan. I have a little training in, in Europe. All say the same. All neurosurgeons say the same. Like, wow. Now I'm repeating this to the family for the 10th time. This is the same because it's difficult to understand for people. Uh, when you have a serious injury, so there is no neurosurgery. There is only ABCD. There is only the resuscitation and you need to do all the requirement for resuscitation. But when you have a serious, a simple injury or a straightforward injury, yeah, this is the time to ask, the question if there is a signs of increasing tracheal pressure or not. Like these are two different scenarios. Just, I want to put it in your mind. You must check the wound. Sometimes wounds just misleading. Sometimes people don't open the, the bandage to see what, what the patient, at least the wound size. And you should, you should do bandaging, especially in pediatric age. And at least you should arrest any bleeding from the scalp. Sometimes you are waiting for the surgery and the scalp just giving blood and the patient will be in shock, especially an infant. I want to stress this. And after that, you can transfer the patient to wherever you want simply. Uh, before transfer a patient with head injury or you are the doctor that receiving the patient, I have two, two points in mind. Please check the chest and check the abdomen. At least this is the most too important. Hemothorax, if it's small, it, it will be missed. And the neurosurgeons, we usually don't use stethoscope at all. And, uh, uh, and for, um, for the abdomen, at least you should check the patient when I receive a patient with head injury, because head injury is severe injury. Usually there is a high risk for multiple organ injury. Just keep it simple. Check the patient chest, check the patient abdomen. If it's okay, then go to the, then receive the patient. That's very important. Sometimes retroperitoneal hematoma easily missed and will be the cause of death. Uh, I want to put this in, in your mind because in a neurosurgery orientation, we don't check the, the, abd the abdomen of the patient. It's not in my mind. It's not in any checklist that I should check. So it's either on the referral or in receiving a patient especially for head injury. Now back to the test. Naba, do you hear me now? Yes, I hear you. I okay. You uh, Arwa, do you hear me? Or still there is an issue with the voice? Okay. Jafar, are you ready? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, okay. So. Nebe and Jaffer, what's this? One term. Uh, epidural on the left side. Also epidural, the epidural go for surgery. Then we will talk about the other things, left side, temporal, whatever. This is, let's go to the surgery. And yeah, you can notice the hematoma outside. It's not about midline shift. Here is the midbrain, and this is the cistern around midbrain, and it's look like compressed. This is the medial part of temporal lobe. I can say this is the uncus, and this is uncle herniation. It's very difficult to see, but as a neurosurgeon, I, I'm, I'm sure that this is the case. Um, what do you think, Nabe Jafar? What's this? Chronic subdural. On the okay. left side. Nabe? Yep, it's a subdural hematoma. Like a... Okay. Um, uh, perhaps it's a, it's a, a sub, um, a large ischemia because I can't see yeah, some. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like any trauma, I usually try to uh, treat bright things. The dark things is not a concern for us. So it's a total different setting. This is it's ischemia. Rough. This is ischemia. This is not a hematoma at all. And I, I maybe my mistake because I put in mind that subdural can occur in a dark uh, color. But yeah, this is ischemia. And you can say that this is uh, from the cortex down. And 
this is exactly the middle cerebral artery ischemia. This is, or I would put it in another term that this is the area of the brain supplied by middle cerebral artery. It's exactly. And what's left in the front is the anterior cerebral artery area. And in the back is the posterior cerebral artery area. And the middle part, basal ganglia will be combined on and shared by all. So just to give you an idea, this is ischemia. The, the only challenge in this case is the midline shift because ischemia usually don't cause a pressure unless it's a malignant infarction or ischemia. It, malignant infarction means a large area and there is acute block. So this can cause a shift. It's very rare, but just to give you an idea that this is a shift and the lesion here is not white, it's not a hematoma. So this is an ischemia. They call it, there is a territory of supply. So it's a, 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 a malignant middle cerebral artery infarction. Yeah, Jafar Nebe, GCS? Uh, three. Three, not four. Why? Uh, flexion on the upper extremities. No. Flexion of the upper extremity can be three or four. The, the extension in lower extremity is only in a three. Do you get my point? That like in a three, it's a flexion. In, a four, in, in four, it's a flexion and with a draw. Like it's more a flexion. Both of them, you will not go to localize. But how I can differentiate one of the things that I can differentiate is the looking to the lower limb. If it's extended, so it's a decorticate position on the M is a three. That's that's important. Jafar uh, Nabe, if we have a CSF leak, what's the risk? I, I'm going to the end of lecture, so just bear this with me. What's the risk if the patient has CSF leak? Uh, let's say the patient after head injury have a, a fracture in the skull and either have a leak of CSF from the nose or from the ear. We call it either rhinorrhea from the nose or otorrhea from the ear. So if the patient have one type of CSF leak, what's the risk? What do you think? Maybe introduction maybe of infection. Infection. Okay, infection maybe introduction. <laughs> next, uh, next time, say infection, direct. You are correct. Both of you are correct. That's good. And what's the good thing? That's the bad thing in CSF leak. What's the good thing? Is it, uh, there is a good thing in CSF leak? Relief of pressure, maybe? Perfect. <laughs> like you are, it, it's, it's not a good thing, but just to put it in mind that the patient, once he has a CSF leak, the, the, you, you will not expect to have increased intracranial pressure. That's, that's the point. That's very important. How we manage these, both of you? Um, so a leak, uh, Thanks, we should, we should ra ra radiograph the patient, perform good imaging. If no indication- One for term. <laughs> I, I mostly. Yeah, perfect. So like, like nothing happened. <laughs> we continue, it's leaking or not, like nothing happened. The, 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 the formal answer would be, I should wait, observe, usually 90% stop within a few weeks, uh, two weeks. If more than two weeks, I should work more to stop it through surgery. And yeah, definitely I will do the investigation you said just Jaffer. What's missed in the Glasgow, just the respiratory effort, sometimes GCS 10 and the patient barely breathing. So he need RCU urgently, regardless the Glasgow. I just put this in, in your mind. And the other point is the pupil. Sometimes the, there is a unilateral dilated pupil. This means that there is hematoma. Usually this hematoma compressing the temporal and this is the oculomotor nerve usually deep and compressing the oculomotor nerve and the patient will have a dilated pupil on the same side. For, so for us, with the GCS examination, we examine the eye of the patient, not looking for 30 or 40 eye abnormality, eye pupil abnormalities. We're looking only for, for two. One of these is dilated pupil, unilateral dilated pupil for us. With the patient of head injury, this is maybe, maybe up to 60% a clue for extradural or subdural at the same side. This is very important. Another clue for the pupil, if it's if you find bilateral pinpoint pupil, 
maybe this is not exactly pinpoint, but this is what I find. And that's that's very important because sometimes there is a poisoning or pontine hemorrhage. Causes of pinpoint pupil, I want to, you to think of two, either poisoning or or pontine. For pontine lesion, that's important. If I see pinpoint, when I go to the CT scan, I should focus on pons sections because it's not there in my mind, especially if there is a small pontine ischemia. The other thing is that maybe just listen to this. The patient have GCS of seven. The CT scan is normal. And now, what do you think? The patient have vague history of a trauma. Just the family bring him. They don't know what happened, but just say that maybe a head injury. GCS normal. G, uh, uh, sorry, GCS seven and the CT scan is normal. The if 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 you are the one that receiving the patient and discover a pinpoint, that's very very helpful. Like maybe opioid poisoning. At least it's reversible. Anyone in the meeting have an idea about other. Uh, explanation of this condition. I will repeat it now. If the patient had GCS 7, a normal CT scan, and there is a history of head injury. So we we uh, we say that if we, uh, in this patient, check the pupil. If it's pinpoint, think of poisoning. Is there any possibility something in neurological like head injury, GCS 7, and you see the CT scan, basically it's normal. Any idea? Can I answer the first? Sure. Okay. Uh, maybe metabolic, something metabolic, like how no. here. No, metabolic, I, I, when I say poisoning, I mean it's non-neurosurgical, something <laughs> related to uh, medicine. So in general, like metabolic included in the poisoning. Any uh, other idea? This will be a bonus question. <laughs> It's simple, GCS7, normal CT scan, and patient with head injury. What, what is the most probable explanation or diagnosis? Uh, can I, uh, maybe lacunar infarction, but I don't no. think it will cause... No, no. Use no. axonal injury? Yeah, perfect. That's the answer. You will have a bonus thing we will discuss later. <laughs> This is the diffuse axonal injury. Diffuse axonal injury, it's not definitely normal CT scan, but basically you will not find things significant in the CT scan that correlate with the poor glass cocoma scale. So this is like the, the shaking and the, con the concussion. This is the cause that cutting all the axons, like ma many of the axons of the brain, with the trauma. So we call it diffuse axonal injury. Please study this. This is interesting. The, the, the huge difference in this scenario, I will put it in this way. This patient with GCS7, CT normal, and there is a vague history of a trauma. If Jafar, let's say, come and say to me that this patient has pinpoint, wow, that's very good. Let's work on it. Maybe a opioid poisoning. It's irreversible. But if there is nothing in the patient, we will go to the diagnosis of diffuse exon axonal more, and we will do MRI. There is a changes in the MRI suggestive or confirming diffuse axonal. The issue with, with diffuse axonal is there is no specific treatment. I mean, it's conservative, and usually it's a poor prognostic injury, just to keep the, the huge difference. So please look to the pupil because it has significance. Recently, the GCS introduced a uh, modification to add the pupil, if both, just look to this, if both pupil are like uh, uh, dilated, this is uh, two, if one dilated, this is one. This is just to be uh, dictated from the total GCS. What I mean is that the new is GCS minus P. So GCS is 10, and the patient has one dilated pupil or one non-reacting pupil, I will say minus one, okay? So it will be nine, something like this. It's not 100% evident or usable, but it's, uh, it's the recent evidence. And yeah, this is the equation. Uh, I think final slides for, yeah, 
go I will go with Jafar and Nabat just to finish the presentation. I need a, a term. Okay, you are correct. And uh, subdural hematoma, the lesser acute. Subdural hematoma. That's it. Uh, it's acute. It's going to the interhemispheric fissure, which is bar poor prognosis, causing edema, compressing the ventricle, and yeah, it's acute subdural hematoma. What's this? For everybody. And uh, raising hands, not Front, everybody in the meeting. Frontal contusion. Perfect, Taha. And what is the site of injury for this patient? Um, frontal. Front, that's, front of that's, that's disaster, Taha. <laughs> or, I mean, occipital from the back of the head. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the contusion, as we said, it's ICH, but very small, very multiple. Usually it's coming from scratching of the brain. Yes, with the, actually, yeah, scratching of the brain with the skull base. When there is, for this patient, if you see, there is occipital injury. So the trauma is here. And the, just because the velocity of the brain is different from the velocity of the skull, because it depends on density. So the brain will, will and it's in CSF, so it will move more rapid than the skull. And at the end, there is a scratching of the brain with the skull. Usually the most common site of contusion, it's bilateral frontal. And the second location is temporal, is rarely to be occipital. And, but uh, as a rule, usually the trauma is from the opposite side. This is very interesting, the contusions. What we will do for contusion, basically we will observe because sometimes they coalesce and uh, uh, will be forming a large hematoma or sometimes just disappear simply. What I will give the patient is prophylactic anti-epileptic because it's highly epileptogenic. If it occurs in frontal and temporal area, the patient may have seizure. So I should give him anti-seizure medication. GCS. Two, three, or two, T. Two, two because it's extension of upper and lower limb. T because it's intubated. So the verbal, I cannot assess it. So I can, I should say T, either tracheostomy or tube. We call it two T. In pediatric, try to focus on both. Don't lie on the patient try to focus on the family and the patient at the same time and be serious, even if it's a pediatric injury. Just to put it in mind, if I have a patient with subdural hematoma, let's say an old age, and the patient is, the, is just in the emergency department with me and I'm following him, I should just put this in your mind. Please check his urea level because sometimes uremia may affect the Glasgow coma scale simply and also be aware of the glucose because hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, all of these, like don't blame coma on the hematoma always. Sometimes there is other causes and it's just needs just observation. For treatment, when you get like six, six year in the medical college or the, let's say the final year, you have 200 disease with 200 drug of choice, and you have many things in mind. If I see a patient with West syndrome, which means that the Salam attack, abnormal seizure, I should give him a treatment as ACTH hormone, like something like these crazy things. However, when you go to the treatment side all over the world, you will face with two or three items and maximum. <laughs> like this is the reality. You have in the pharmacy two or three active treatment type. So either you give the patient painkiller or antibiotic or fluid. That's the main three options. And we, ma we manage the patient usually with these things. No more drug of choices, especially I'm, I'm saying it's in the head injury setting, it's in the emer emergency. What, what, why I say that? Because based on the guideline, it's all optional. The only evident treatment for head injury, for all of head injury, at least it's not all, is head elevation. Head elevation will decrease the intracranial pressure. Other options are, it depends. Like, should I give anti-seizure? Yeah, but it depends on the case. Should I give deep anti-pain treatment? Yeah, but sometimes it's not given because I don't want the patient to lose his GCS. I want to observe him more. 
like everything is variable. The only one is head elevation will decrease the intracranial pressure. And by the way, it's not all the time. There is some exceptions. Um, the outcome usually depends on many things. It's just an amazing outcome sometimes that with all the disasters that uh, that occur with the injury and what happened after the injury, sometimes surgery, sometimes complication, but still there is some cases that made it an, and like a miracle. It depends mainly on the age. CT scan finding, initial finding is very important. Pupil reactivity, always one of the signs. Post resuscitation, GCS, if after I resuscitate a, a shocked patient and GCS is not improved, this is a very poor prognostic sign. Hypotension, this is not a neurosurgery. There is basically what I want to put in mind, like in the majority of things, everything in the brain cause hypertension. Stroke, hypertension. Head injury, hypertension. Increase in intracranial pressure, hypertension. If there is hypertension, it's a huge concern. There is injury in the abdomen mist. There is injury in the chest mist. There is something. There is injury in the spine. Yeah, the final questions. What's this? Epidural hematoma. Subdural hematoma. Yeah, that, that's that's simple. Like epidural, epidural. That's that's our tar target. GCS. <laughs> three, three, three. <laughs> yeah, three. But but the I four. That's I don't know what what's this position, but the, the I four. <laughs> yeah, the motor three. Take home message. Uh, do not panic. GCS is the most important. Respiratory usually missed. Pupil maybe give you a different treatment. Weakness always missed <laughs> like when 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 we do all the things to the patient and at the end <laughs> the, with the reassessment you feel oh this is a weakness in the right upper limb because in the gcs when we have a motor it's the best motor response so when he's obeying command i will not focus on the other side so just i want to put it in mind the wound is very important sometimes Sometimes you forget about it. Hypotension is alarming. What's this? Epidural. Yeah. yeah, even if it's like, I don't know what happened, but it's epidural, <laughs> at least. There is a, a cyst inside, which is congenital arachnoid cyst, and there is a hematoma, and it's very, very large. And yeah. Like this is the evacuation. Even we we try to illustrate this just to make people understand what happened in this CT scan. And I, I want just to put this in your mind, like how big is the hematoma? Do you see if, if this is the, the equator? And yeah, this is like more than a third of the brain. And the patient, like very good condition. Uh, I think we published this like a hematoma with epsilateral arachnoid cyst and the BMJ, and I think sub uh, presented in some conference. What's this? Gunshot wound. Gunshot Definitely, wound. yeah. Penetrating. Gunshot wound, this is like if you, if you are a bypasser in the street <laughs> for a neurosurgery orientation, yeah, I need gunshot wound penetrating or perforating, or sometimes there is tangential, just a superficial wound. For me, this is a gravitational. This is the entry, and this is the gravitational usually go out, up. Do you know the falling bullet, the gravitational bullet? So this is the typical example. Usually the injury is up and the bullet down, and usually in, in not a correct position because it's a, a slow bullet as compared to the direct bullet. So the brain can change the position of the bullet. And even for this case in a specific, we wait and the patient lying supine, who's the who's the person with the gravity and the weight question? And just we leave the patient supine and there is hematoma. So uh, when the hematoma resolve, the bullet is just go down. And yeah, now we do a surgery and remove it. So it's like <laughs> waiting to, to the bullet to come to you. This, this is just an example uh, of different treatments. We publish it is that the role of strict patient position during nursing. Is it there is a role or 
or this is just a, a single case. That's it. Uh, I, I want to understand the, I want you to understand the radiology a little bit, but the most important, the significance, the surgical significance, the outcome significance. I think that's what our task today. And yeah, usually you build a, a, a bubble of how to think, how to decide. So whenever there is a huge stressful situation during your work, you will be fully prepared. And thank you. Um, I, uh, you can, uh, like, uh, you can, uh, lower your hand, uh, for a little bit, let's have a risk and a little bit coffee. Uh, I, uh, we have, uh, like, if you have a question about this presentation, I would like to hear it after, uh, like, maybe 15 minutes, uh, just put it on the paper, just put it on the notes uh, anywhere, because I, I think we need some discussion about it. And uh, now I want to ask if, um, uh, if uh, who's, who's ready for to give a presentation? Is Huda ready? Is Huda here? Can, can we, uh, uh, John, can we? Uh, hey, who is it? Hoda. Hoda are, in, are they in the panel now? You see them? I see Tiba. Tiba, are you there? Tiba, do you hear me? Uh, yes, Dr. Hose, I can hear you. I'll just contact uh, Hoda because yeah, I'm not yeah. sure she's in here. I'll... Yeah, I'm promoting her. She's, she's here. Um, okay. Did you need anything from me? No, no, just I'm confirming if, if you are both oh. alive or not. <laughs> uh, Huda, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Yeah, so share your screen, introduce yourself, and go through a presentation for all, for all the participants. I would like you just to enjoy this next presentation. It's made for you just to think, and then put your question and you have a discussion after that. Yeah, the stage is yours, Huda. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Uh, hello everyone. This is Huda Jaffer, a fourth year medical student from Baghdad, Iraq. And um, in this presentation, I will share with you my journey through the, neuro through the neurosurgery field. Um, this journey was no walk in the park. It was difficult and filled with fears and doubts. And that's what I will share with you in the, in the upcoming slides. Um, first, to be a surgeon or a physician. Um, as a first year medical student, as any other uh, first year medical student, um, in my first year, I buy a lab coat and a stethoscope, and I buy a surgical scrubs. I try the lab coat and the stethoscope on, and I take dozens of pictures. I'm happy and everything is fine. And then I uh, try the scrubs, and for the first time in my life, I get this great feeling of excitement and joy. And it was, uh, it was that uh, uh, good feeling that I kept the scrubs on for the rest of the day. I didn't take them off. And um, I, I, I ended up walking around the house with a big childish smile on my face. That was the moment when I realized this is the job for me. I want to be a surgeon, not um, a physician. At that time, I didn't have neurosurgery on my mind at all. But um, one day, as I was just casually scrolling through my Instagram feed, I came across um, a post about a neurosurgical mentorship program for for, um, for students who are interested in neurosurgery as a future career. I decided to attend this, um, this meeting um, just out of curiosity to see what the neurosurgery is. And uh, uh, it says in the announcement that it will be a four hour long meeting. Uh, I expected to uh, get uh, bored after 40 minutes and leave, 
Um, but what happened is that I actually uh, uh, ended up feeling sad because it ended after more than uh, after more than five hours. Um, at that day, I became uh, seriously interested in the neurosurgery field. But then came another question: Is it really worth it? Uh, is it worth it putting all that time uh, into these meetings, uh, these long meetings? three hour long, four hour long meetings, um, uh, then I had to sit down and have a serious conversation with myself. Um, uh, and I realized that I do enjoy these meetings. I, I am genuinely interested in the topics that are being presented and, uh, and in, that, uh, in the discussions and I enjoy them. I, um, I don't get bored at all. So why not? I just uh, attended them. I kept on attending them all the time, <laughs> all the time. Um, uh, but then, uh, but then comes out uh, another uh, fear. As I was watching my uh, colleagues in the mentorship, they were attending surgeries. Uh, I couldn't help but questioning: Am I capable of keeping up with all those uh, smart and hardworking students? Will I be as good as they are? They, some of them actually are younger than me. Am I going to be uh, good enough? I was actually scared um, to attend surgeries in the beginning. Um, I, I thought because of my lack of knowledge, I will uh, make mistakes and embarrass myself. I remember uh, particularly that one time when I volunteered to attend a surgery and uh, I spent, I, it was an ACOM clipping, uh, aneurysm clipping. And I spent the whole night uh, watching videos and reading about it. And in the morning, I got too scared and canceled just a few hours before the, the time. That's how scared I was. Uh, after a long and continuous um, fight with myself and with my peers, I decided to give myself a second chance. And I gathered all my strength and volunteered again. Um, and this was the best day ever in my life. Uh, um, that, um, that day, um, uh, we spent 12 hours in the, in the hospital and um, we, uh, uh, we did several angiograms of uh, several patients. Uh, we attended uh, angiograms of patients and it was, um, uh, it was uh, an, an amazing time. Um, I, I spent almost 90% of the time on my feet um, really tiring and exhausting, um, but I enjoyed it despite, uh, despite um, all the uh, exhaustion at the end of the day. I uh, uh, couldn't help um, but being amazed uh, by how com uh, uh, complicated is the, um, the brain circulation. And uh, I, I just uh, can't help but being interested in um, solving the puzzles of these uh, complicated uh, um, blood vessels, and um, uh, and then I attended a second time. Uh, uh, I got encouraged to uh, uh, go to the hospital again. Uh, this time, there weren't as uh, many medical students as the first time. Uh, it was just me and, and another medical student. So I got um, a little bit more involved. And um, the team actually uh, gave me the task to reassure one of the patients because she was um, uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit scared. She had some concerns, and uh, I felt like a real doctor. And uh, it was really nice uh, to have this connection with a patient. Um, the question uh, that I had after all these experiences was: Should I really continue? And um, my answer is yes, personally, because uh, I, I really enjoy. I'm interested in the. Uh, in this field, and I really enjoy uh, learning about neurosurgery. And um, uh, no matter how hard and how uh, exhausting it is, um, uh, I can't uh, <laughs> I can't uh, help but being uh, really uh, 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 but being really interested in this field. So uh, for my for me, yes, I will continue. Um, uh, uh, next. What is next? Uh, what's next is uh, always hungry for more. I will always be learning about neurosurgery. I will um, 
uh, always uh, keep educating myself about the brain. Even if somehow in the future I didn't end up being a neurosurgeon, I will still uh, enjoy uh, learning about the brain because it's, um, it's, a, it's one of the most amazing organs uh, of the human body. And uh, that's, that's what uh, the future will be like for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Hida. Uh, I like I like this presentation. Uh, I think the topic you chose is unique, and basically you are describing or sharing with us your story. And but I feel at the same time, many of us can uh, can think in the same. Uh, especially those in the beginners, the, those with the resident, even the for the graduate, how to think. And maybe people have different questions of these. Maybe some people have 20 questions. Some people have only three questions remaining. But yeah, when, when, when you show me this presentation first, I, I think I, I, I say to you today, like, uh, you, you should present it today directly because this is this is very very interesting. Uh, thank you for preparing this. Thank you. I I, I know that it's 90, 90 minutes before the meeting. I decide that you will give this speech today. Uh, so thank you, Huda. And uh, uh, if you have any question about Huda's presentation, about Huda's comment. Uh, let's let's uh, let's listen to this first. Then we will go through other topics. Yeah. Uh, if you have any comment, just raise your hand uh, on Huda's presentation, on Huda's topic. Yeah, Tiba. Uh, first of all, thank you, Huda, for your presentation. I believe it's a, it's a very crucial thing for medical students and even residents to see such stories because we can all relate to some points or most of the points that you've mentioned. And I believe when we find something relatable, you, we find more comfort in it and then we um, find it easier at least. So thank you so much for your presentation. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, now I see you after the presentation. Uh, yeah, Jafar. Uh, thank you so much for this beautiful presentation. I can see uh, from how you described and talked about neurosurgery, you're very uh, passionate about it. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Uh, congratulations for that. Congratulations for finding your passion. So, what would be your uh, perhaps some speciality that of neurosurgery you're most interested in? Do you have that yet or no? Um, thank you, Jaffer, for your question. Uh, I don't have a specific specialty yet, but um, I'm interested in a few of them. Uh, I'm interested in the vascular uh, compartment and the pediatric neurosurgery. Um, I think those are the, um, the ones I'm most interested about currently. Thank you, thank you, Jaffer, for the question. Thank you. Definitely, you will you will not be interested in the spine if you are working with me. You should explore other options in the future. Uh, and uh, if anybody has any uh, like more comments on uh, Huda's topic, I think this is. Ju I I just put it uh, for you. Uh, I think this is that the time that yeah you can think of these options for everybody. There is no. Uh, correct pathway or incorrect pathway, you should choose the best for you. And at the same time, you should get use of the chances because sometimes chances means something that that's better for you for the future. Uh, I can see the... 
Key you on? I it was really helpful and useful. Uh, ask you if other um, you try your brush other than uh, your surgery before making your. Uh, Nargis, can you introduce yourself and repeat the question because it's uh, it was not clear for us, please. Uh, I'm I'm Nargis Kalam from uh, Baghdad, uh, and Iran University. Uh, I thank you, Huda, for your helpful. I was I have the same feelings as you about neurosurgery and other branches. I'm just asking if you try other branches and try to attend in uh, surgeries or try try it like you in your surgery before you uh, thank you Nergis, for your question um, i personally did not uh, attend any surgeries in any other branches um, i read about them i i watch a lot of youtube videos about the other branches but i did not attend any surgeries and before making the decision about uh, neurosurgery in particular, I was interested in um, in, uh, ophthalmo, uh, in ophthalmo surgery and uh, uh, cardio surgery as well, cardio uh, uh, cardio uh, system as well. And but then I int uh, got introduced to the neurosurgery field and uh, decided on neurosurgery. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Nargis. Uh, actually, both of you are correct. I, I think we discussed that that in the previous meeting. That logic goes with Nargis' opinion that yeah, you should attend all type of surgery then decide. But uh, I I also confirm that the other alternative option sometimes you are there to go to this pathway, whether neurosurgery, neurology, whatever. But sometimes the things happen just to get you in this direction and try to make use of it. Uh, it depends, like, this is the, dis the only decision that I cannot help with for my students or my mentee. Like, this is, you should decide first. After your decision, I can help you a lot. Uh, so, yeah, the deep thinking and have all these idea, like Nargis' uh, opinion, Huda opinion, that's very important for everybody because at the end, every one of us will go in a different direction, in a different story. So having all these opinion at early stage, that, that's very helpful. Yeah, Anab. Hello, everyone. I'm Anab Osama, medical student in the third stage at University of Baghdad, Iraq. Actually, I am a member in the uh, previous Hosen Neurosurgical Mentorship. It's the same uh, mentorship that Huda was. So I want to say thanks a lot, Huda, for your presentation. Actually, uh, I'm totally agree with you. When you want to be creative and want to improve yourself, this is important to have uh, the opportunities. Um, the difference between us is only that I, 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 I want to be a neurosurgeon from the beginning. But uh, actually, it's the same pathway when you want to say it's... it's um, worth it to be continue in that or it's true or not so um that's what we see in this lecture in this mentorship yes uh, it's worth it and uh, we get many opportunities and hope that all of you guys here get the same and more so thanks a lot uh, huda and thanks for dr hurst to make us involved again in this mentorship thanks a lot you're more than welcome anna thank you thank you anna uh Basically, I confirm what you say, but yeah, d definitely there is opinion. It, it depends, like what's correct for me, it's not correct. It, it's not 100% per percent correct for other. Um, there is a question from Sadim. Or... Can I ask my question? Yeah, yeah, K1. Sorry, sorry. Hi, uh, uh, my name is yeah. K1. I'm a resident from Suleimania, uh, Iraq, Kurdistan. Uh, Welcome. I had a question. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation and for this opportunity. We really appreciate it. Um, my question is kind of personal. So I've been struggling with choosing a specialty and been struggling with neurology and neurosurgery. I know that I want to pursue my career in a brain-related field, 
but have difficulty in choosing as you know the lifestyle changes everything changes so do you have any advices uh regarding that matter like what factors should i consider what things should, should i put into the equation thank you very much thank you kevin uh, sorry for missing your comment because you just lower your hand so i cannot recognize you, you on the screen uh yeah you are welcome uh i think for you like uh, you are close to have this decision this is very important my answer is two point the first point is that i cannot advise you directly i can share my story at least and then you can relate on the other specialty or can relate on yourself like you have a different characteristic than everybody else so you know which is the best or which is the the correct for you for us it's only sharing experience then you will be uh, ready to have let's say the lessons behind these uh, the things that we are sharing through mentorship it's all lessons that we learned maybe in a good way maybe in the tough way but at the end it's just lessons you can you, you when you feel these emotions when you feel these uh, when you go through through these cases this is very important as a part of your decision as i think however the second point is that everybody is biased by his passion especially when the, when there is a correct like when there is a definite passion so i am biased however i i will offer you and i will offer everybody thinking uh, deeply in this and have this decision to have a private session this is thing that i do it a lot i did it a lot and i i, I will be happy to help at any time uh, the idea is to have a private session with you only just understand a little bit about your background your expectation your dreams your situation then i can put like a multiple plan for each step like that that's i think from my experience this is very helpful like uh, i want to go to neurosurgery okay where to go i can give you 10 options that are possible and what are the pros and cons for each then after that as a lifestyle or let's say where i would practice this how is the difference that i would make in the society how is the difference i would make let's say in Soleimania, my city what are the other surgeon have a characteristic and what will be my target to be a unique uh, surgeon and to provide or let's say neurologist and to provide a new things in the future because i think that's one of the major concern that you are preparing early because at least you want to be a, a someone more productive more prepared the second um, uh, let's say the second side of the uh, of the issue is that you need something more matching with your lifestyle with your area of brilliance like each each one has his strength point the better choice will be the choice that will bring the best in q1 and 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 the main factor i will give an example if i am the one who's analyzing and thinking and want to de to go deep in uh, in uh, science let's say i will go with some something more in neuro neurology neuroscience rather than direct action if i am the person that i like the challenge more i i want to make a like an instant different in in people life that will will go with the neurosurgery that's just an example sometimes people think that neurology have more science sometimes people think on the opposite that neurology is good however there is no actions in neurology is more an understanding but treatment wise it's less action or let's say less drama or and ups and downs in the treatment usually drugs and uh, that that's a huge part like if you if if you ask about the knowledge if you ask about the treatment my daily practice like neurology is a, a thing and neurosurgery totally different thing 
However, I should say that many of the neurology, if they go through interventional neurology, basically they will have the life of a neurosurgery equally. It's the same. Like you will have a patient calls, overnight treatment, overnight procedure and surgeries. So now it's mixed at a some at some point. So it depends on your decision. For me, this is the this is the time of sharing and exposure for everybody. But once you you want to take a decision, yeah, let's go. Let's make what what I call it a private session. Uh, not uh, planning for you, but at least suggestion suggestion of different pathway or give you the most uh, the most I know about the orientation at least. I think that would be helpful, and we have many examples that's that's totally uh, helpful. That's the maximum. Advice is no, direction no. And as I said, this is the one of the most critical decision in your life. What I want to say here, that I always ask my resident that, uh, or let's say th those who just graduate from medical school, and they, uh, they say, oh, maybe neurosurgery, there is a huge uh, time I will spend in a training while, while other specialty are easier. I ask them that when you will be retired, and this will be 40 years later. So now you are taking the decision for the next 40 years based on how hard will be the first or, or second year of your residency. That's very important to put, put in your mind because that's a critical decision. You should have this decision and those courses that that's our course is one example of is just an, uh, just a helpful asset. You, if 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 it's accessible, try to make use of them, and it depends on your personality. It depends on your preference. And the most important, the situations affect people. Like sometimes I can, I I would like, but I can't. That's that's very important. Uh, thank you, Kwan, for uh, your question. Is, is that answered in some way or another? Yes, uh, and really appreciate the private session. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It's a free, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> ju ju just put your uh, like probable time, and we uh, and we will manage. Uh, thank you. Uh, I I will go to the uh, next. Uh, th thank you, Huda, again for this presentation. I think it changed the mood from the studying and this uh, and the CT scans to back to our personality and for for those participating the student and the graduate the resident to think about themselves their future their pathway that's very important and thank you uh i will go to the next uh item i want to share definitely some video with you and i will be happy if you are ready to comment and go through the same journey Today, we have a different story. I want to get it out before I start the sharing just to preserve time. Um, don't forget to put your question and in, in notes and write it. For for questions in chat, I will not I cannot go through it. Just I will ask. Toiba and, and Zainab and Zina just write these questions to get it at the end. I will start sharing. Please raise your hand if you want to participate in this uh, part of the presentation. Um, I hope I can see. Do you see my screen? Yes. And tip number one, keep your desktop clean so you'll be easier to manage things. <laughs> so the f I will go through very rapid videos just describing the, let's say the aneurysm treatment, just an example, because this is the second day for aneurysm, maybe the last day. So one of our friend is the app surgeon, the Federico who's, who's doing this. It's, it's a good thing. 
And what, what I want is not about the app. It's about just, I want to give you an idea about the aneurysm surgery, the basics, because we go directly to the video in the previous session. It's a simplification. We can we want to do opening to go deep to the vessel. And for me, this view is very, very important. Like what you see now is the real anatomy, the upside down anatomy. So the carotid will be up and the middle cerebral will be down. That's very important. And it's not only upside down, it's even oblique. Like the these are the two carotid and the basilar will be here. And if I ask you, what is the tip of basilar? you will say yes at this point. And where is the beginning of basilar will be down. And you, do, you, do you hear this term down? <laughs> the down here is just up. So yeah, this is part of understanding of or how challenging will be the neuroanatomy. And uh, when we go direct, you need to perfect the positioning of the patient and because this will affect the exposure and the better uh, will be for the patient. Then the steps, open the skin, remove the scalp. I want to go through this just to give you an idea. Then usually do more larger opening than this. This is just an example. And this is the dura when we open it. And this is the brain. Then you try to dissect to go between the skull and the brain. This is very important. And you can notice the vessel at the depth. I think that gives like the previous time we start the video from this point, like there is a vessel and yeah, let's go. So this just give you an idea, like this uh, optic nerve, optic chiasm, how is the orientation? And uh, also if we go to the closure, it's the same steps. What I found interesting to share with you is, some, um, I, I don't know this, uh, like I, I don't know them in person, but this is very, very interesting. I found it and I think it deserves sharing. I will share some part of it with you. Is the, is the sound clear? Do you hear them? Um, there's no audio right now. Do you hear it? No, doctor, there's no sound. No, you, you have to um, mark it okay. when you start the screen share, Samar. You'd have to start the screen share again and mark play video. Okay, mark the play video. Like down, optimize the video. Yeah, share part. the screen, and there's a not there's a box that says says uh, to hear the audio, play the audio. You uh, see that when you the first screen you open when you yeah click yeah, on screen, but screen. but it's not clickable, unfortunately. Oh, it's not okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No problem. I I will comment on this. Uh, yeah. So the idea is ju just just. Yeah, uh, so the idea is that it's just a simple teaching for children, but I think she's a doctor and teaching her son how to do aneurysm surgery, a brain aneurysm surgery. And it's very simplified. Uh, I think uh, uh, if you see the layers, they made it very well. I would suggest to go through this because they are describing a technical point that this is the bone, this is the temporalis muscle, you must remove part of temporalis. and how to drill it and yeah, make things simple. The arachnoid layer and over the brain, <laughs> like it's it's a detailed one. It's not a simple, just a cartoon. And uh, they go and they found the aneurysm and the aneurysm is just like part of uh, a, 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 a fold with, with air. So it's compressible. Then they put a clip and by the way, this clip that they will use, which is we use it for other uses. This is the basic idea of the clip. This is the origin from where they get the clip. And now they puncture it and there is pop 
and there is no blood. She asked him, she asked the kid, there is a blood? No, because we did the clipping correctly. <laughs> and yeah, how, how to close and how to replace the dura. Uh, I found it interesting because it's related to our topic. And from that, I will go to one of the best institutes, uh, Baro Institute. She, they have very, very interesting illustration always. Just to make it simple, these are 20 second. This is the vessel. This is the aneurysm. Because I know there is multiple level of students. Still, some people didn't understand what's happening. So this is the aneurysm. And this is the neck. This is how we clip. And that's it. And with the time, this will go and shrink. The the video before the like these are the last one from those series is that I think video from UAE, Dr. Muawad, his endovascular. This is describing the alternative option, like how we do a femoral puncture. I will take only a few seconds of it go through iliac, then aorta, then ascending aorta, then from that to carotid, then go to the brain. So this is the idea. And if you, if you have aneurysm, you have two options, main two options in endovascular. So either you go and put coils inside. I think this part of the video is very important, what we mean by coiling. So we will fill it, and with the time, there is no blood enter. Alternative option is that we, uh, sorry, we 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 go past the aneurysm and focus on the main vessel and put a stent on the main vessel, and this will prevent blood going to the aneurysm. With the time, it will shrink and closed. So this is very uh, different. I and the principle of treatment how we choose between them that's that's the with the time with the experience with the size and depth of aneurysm uh that's that's my message from the this those demo videos i will go through uh two more video to conclude this little uh video sessions so this is just an example of PCOM aneurysm, I, I keep more PCOM just because you have some orientation for it. And this is more reality when we go to the brain, we put a cotinoid just, just to protect it and go inside. Sometimes the brain is very tight because it's a recent subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's not the normal brain. And we go inside. I want to just to show you some point Obviously, this is also a left a left side case, so it's easier for you. So do you know what's this? The optic nerve. Optic. Left optic, perfect. And this should be the carotid lateral to it. Then, uh, uh, by the way, I puncture something above the optic, which get me CSF, we call lamina terminalis, just to relax the brain and then go more deep. Do you know what, what we cut in, in, in this, like what we are cutting? The answer is arachnoid. And with the time, we cannot see the aneurysm beginning, which is very risky for us. We need to see the aneurysm beginning. As you know, we need to clip the neck. So we go through this bony part, try to open the dura from it. Then do you know what's this bony part? Anyone have an idea or background? This is like, this is more for resident, but we drill it. This anterior anti-reclinoid process. The, the point from this video is that you can see how risky this procedure at this point. Just imagine that this is the operative field and this is you are a surgeon this is your left hand and this is your right hand and you are drilling a bone and what's this carotid carotid so so in case you missed two millimeter the patient will be dead that's how precise you will be <clears throat> like if you are doing such procedure 
and how well it trained. Actually, it's not a personal trait. It's more than it's it's more than a training things. You can see how how risky this step is, and uh, usually uses specific drills that cannot uh, that there is a less risk of injury to the surrounding structures, and the target. Our target is to go there to see the beginning of aneurysm. Let's let me get you oriented. Um, Mohammed Amara, I know him. Osama, I know him. Mustafa, Nicola, I need more name of the. Oh, okay, the same. So, uh, let me ask this question with annotation. Uh, I can annotate. Maybe not. Okay, I I will ask this. Uh, if this is the optic. This is the carotid. What's this? What's this part? What do you think? Anybody? Fula. Sorry? From those who yes. raise their hand. Mm, insula? No. It's tem temp temporal temp lobe. Yeah, yeah perfect. Lobe. Yeah. Temporal lobe. Perfect. And this this should be the frontal. frontal so, yeah. so usually you split the sylvian into frontal and temporal. That's why I use the left side and PCOM again, just to, to get rid of the orientation thing because it's difficult. The insula will be in the depth. You are correct, but it will be in the depth. And now, where is the aneurysm? If it's PCOM aneurysm, it should be here below the section device. So the issue is that when we go to the aneurysm, we don't see the beginning of aneurysm. So this means I should go. I should go and take part of this bone to have access to the beginning of aneurysm. Because as you as you already saw before, that we need to put a clip, one limb of the clip before the aneurysm neck, and the other limb after the aneurysm clip. So we should clear this area. That's why we are doing this drilling. It's not for all cases. Actually, it's very rare for PCOM cases. It depends on the location of aneurysm or from where it starts. So now you can see this is the carotid and this is the aneurysm. And we are going to see a little bit something before the aneurysm. And now this is a very risky step to make a cotter. cotter. Do you see? <laughs> You see, this step just we make a cautery that we are burning part of the dura just to have a space, but we are just above the carotid. So, this means very low uh, uh, grade of cauterization and should be very accurate. Now, I think it's better. You can see with me. Uh, let's let's take Osama. Do you see the, the difference that the left hand holding the arachnoid, which is adherent to the vessel, and the right hand just cutting. Are you with me, Osama? Yes. Yeah. So I would ask something here. Like, there is a simple question. Why you do this with scissor? Why? Maybe it's risky. Do you have an, any idea about it? The, like, because this is a detail, but I want to put this information in your mind. Like we use sharp dissection most of the time because it's more repairable. Like even if, if you do a puncture here, you can suture it. However, if you use just a blunt dissection, like this is just to pull the two parts apart, maybe you cause a huge tear that it's not repairable. You get my point? So that's why yes. we are... That's why we are doing this critical step by cutting the arachnoid just on the aneurysm. It's very risky. It can rupture at any time. Do you see? And now it's the, do you, what's, what's this part? Osama. Um, that's the aneurysm? Of yeah. The uh, uh, this is the end of aneurysm, let's say. So I want to hold this. This is the carotid and the aneurysm will be here. And this is the beginning of aneurysm, and this is the end. Okay, so we are clearing both end. Let's say we call it the proximal and distal part of the neck. And after you get a good access, yeah, why you are waiting? Go and clip it. And do you see the the angle of a clip? There is a huge number and uh, shapes of the clips. You just 
choose the one that you feel it's it's appropriate. And now we are clipping the aneurysm and that's it. Do you notice like how simple this procedure now when you get through the uh, exact steps again and again, you will notice how it will be easy at some point in some cases, but yeah, this is like, they call it like a ballet dancing because it's going through the spaces between the brain and skull. It's very nice, very delicate, and you can treat the the you can treat the problem like treat the real cause of the problem, and that's that's the nice thing about it. And now I want to focus with me because this is the last video. I think the most important. And. Should I say what's the case? <laughs> it's left PCOM. <laughs> I noticed that we have a lot of, le of left PCOM because when I search for you about videos, and yeah, this is also left PCOM. And let's look, this is the carotid. Now it's more tense. There is uh, adhesions, there is a blood because of subarachnoid hemorrhage. You cannot clean all the things with the wash. There is some still tissues are red. What I can see now is that this is maybe the carotid and this is the aneurysm. Maybe I want to see more to make sure this is the carotid looks for me. Should be the optic here, left optic, left carotid. And do you see the aneurysm now? Anybody? Just, just give, give me yes, the yes. okay. Just yes, in yes. Okay, so that that's that's very important. Now we go carotid aneurysm, and we go. What, what's this part? This is the proximal neck part, and we know what we want to do to make a space for the clip, and. Then we should go on the other part of aneurysm here. Uh, this is not a bleeding. This is just a CSF washing blood in the field. So you can remove part of it. This is the section device, the large one for the assistant to help you in case, because it looks, I think, what I want to give you an idea that every case is different. Sometimes it's, it looks simple. Sometimes the carotid artery is totally different from the other one. Now we will go and continue uh, like the section proximal and distal to the neck. This, this is very important. I want you to focus on this. Like this is the proximal part of the neck. This is the distal part of the neck. Yeah, Osama, can you describe? Um, I think what I'm seeing from the top is the proximal side of the, or the, yeah, I think it is the proximal side of the aneurysm, maybe. And, and there's also a lot of bleeding. Yeah, I think um, the aneurysm was, it wasn't clipped, it was mostly like dissected, and there's a lot of hemorrhage coming out. There's hemorrhage. <laughs> it's hurting right now. <laughs> yeah, I think you can expect what's happening now outside the field. <laughs> Maybe the surgeon is, ta is start crying <laughs> because it looks like more difficult than the rupture that we see before. Maybe. And now. These are like the, you know, that like this is a assistant and surgeon hands. And you are trying just to find, just to get control of the blood. And if you remember the previous time we cannot clip, but in this time we try the, the large clip first. And it's done. 
it's a, it's it's a non-edited video so <laughs> that's the real time from going to hell then back to normal and i, I would i would show you the that part again because i think like this one is um one of the most frightening rupture that i have in my surgeries like one two three <laughs> you can you can see the hand of surgeon just pulled from the field which is me <laughs> Because I'm I'm expecting this huge gush. But let's think again. You are the responsible. You are the one that you should save the life of this patient. So you don't have a time even for to think for what I feel. Just go to the next step of our checklist. I think we are now talking about the second section device, if if it's ready or at least it's stuck in somewhere, then uh, I'm asking about a specific uh, size and shape of clipping. We already prepared a few clips that I have in mind from the CTA, but I should have a choice like give me this or give me this. So you need very active assistant, usually one of the senior resident or one of the surgeons that, we, because you know, we work as a team, at least three or four surgeons. So now the surgeon and assistant working in this, and yeah, at least we can see the carotid because this is very important to us. And I don't know the exact time from the rupture to this, but I we can see now. Yeah, this is into the rupture and and before for like it's it's exactly let's say two minutes till this. Okay. <laughs> um I think that's that's just a, an idea about like to, to inform more about what we have before about the aneurysm aneurysm and rupture. And I think uh, I have two more video, totally different topic. I will go through it uh, after just having your comments or questions, uh, what you have in mind. And um, yeah, I, I can relate from that. Um, any comment? Yes, doctor, I have a question. Uh, who's? Mohamed Amar. Mohamed Amar, okay. Yes. Do you always uh, clip if an aneurysm ruptured? Uh, you are asking about the clips or about the aneurysm? No, if the aneurysm uh, ruptures, do you always clip or you do other types of uh, management? The, there is alternative options. Uh, sometimes we can, yeah, like, it, it ends always with clipping that's what what i i should say like sometimes you do suturing for the rupture point or the tear point but at the end you you clip part of it or sometimes you just do a, a wrapping of muscle or any tissue just to like bandaging of the vessel but at some point you put a clip on the side just to hold this bandage just to give you an ideas but we usually do this clipping. Otherwise, if, if it's uncontrollable, I will take the superficial temporal artery and anastomose it with the middle cerebral artery and then close the whole carotid, let's say. And this is called bypass or anastomosis. It will take at least one hour. And you, you need to have some control in this time. Usually we are already preparing to do the bypass if the cases are too complex. But for this, that aneurysm even, even if you want to do just trapping, you need a clips. So it always ends with the clips. But if you have something behind that question, I would be, I would be happy. Like, do you have any idea other than a clip? No, I, would, I was just uh, thinking if the tear was at the neck itself, it would be very hard to clip it because you are will because you will clip one side only so you can't uh, 
have a certain, so you can't have a, a, a control the plug around the whole neck. Yeah, I I think uh, the and and tomorrow presentation we have some uh, middle cerebral artery aneurysm. We have some other uh, lesion moya moya, but you will see in one of the cases an answer to this. Like I will clip the same area, but I will take more from the carotid, like more than the neck, to include the tear with it. Like that that's the general idea. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thanks to. Thank you. you. Thank you, Mohammed. Yeah, Osama, do you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, so it's it's known that the brain or neural tissue is very prone to ischemic injury. Um, but I remember in uh, a previous uh, lecture or session you've given us that there's a window of 10 minutes when it comes to um, intraoperative rupture. So why is it 10 minutes specifically? Like, basically, it depends on your collateral. And I think you are the person asking about the collateral for the, like, in one of the previous sessions. So you have a little idea about it, at least. So, yeah, it depends on collaterals. Uh, I, give an I gave an example about that. We depend if we have the intraoperative monitoring because for, like, back in Iraq, it's not always available. But if we have the intraoperative monitoring, I will depend much on it on the timing otherwise i will keep to the general rule like uh, as a question is that a scientific evidence for the exact minutes the answer is no why there is no answer because it's quite variable it depends about which vessel that you are talking about you are talking about temporary clipping of carotid aca mca it depend also it depend on the status of collateral in that patient in that side of hemisphere. So that's the answer. And there is an additive factor is that the personal difference, like some brains tolerate more area of ischemia than others. That's that's the answer. But for you, like Osama, if, if we are talking as a surgeon, that's the importance of training or let's say of fellowship. When you do a fellowship with a person doing only vascular, let's say, and doing hundreds per year, you will have the confidence with those things. Like, what the exact time? I can do up to 20 minutes sometimes. I can I can relate. It's, it depends on the size of artery. I can remove and the temporary and get back again. So, yeah, that's that's the the experience behind the 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 topics. Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, so that's that's what even behind the guideline. Because if you, if you ask this question, is that an evidence for that? Yeah, definitely there is evidence. What's the level of evidence? It's definitely level three. Like it depends more on the experience, uh, and it depends on the case, and even for the patient if he has a weakness if he has already ischemia that that's a total different so uh, and at the same time if you have a, a, a plan for temporary clipping there is a, a steps that can be done by the anesthesia just to protect the brain we call it brain protection and yeah there is a many factor the target is to prevent ischemia but sometimes with all that we say till now I cannot control it. I am obligated to leave the temporary clip up to 20 minutes. It happens. It depends. Thank you so much for answering my question. You are welcome. Uh, Mustafa, do you have a question? Uh, yes, Doctor, I have a question. I was thinking about uh, if there is any scoring system that can we use to expect uh, the ruptured aneurysm before the procedure. Like if we do a retrospective study about the radioimaging or the history of the patient, uh, is there anything like that to expect the rupture? Yeah, I, I would suggest always to simplify the question before going to which type of study and these things, because these are just distracting the idea. The, the idea is that you want to expect what? The rupture of aneurysm 
or yes. the intraoperative rupture because this is not a rupture on oh, your the well, yeah the intraoperative rupture it depends there is four types of intraoperative rupture sometimes intraoperative rupture occur just after anesthesia while doing the craniotomy while doing the bar hole outside it's early rupture sometimes occur during the section of the neck sometimes occur after the clipping because the clipping is not complete so there is actually three or four stages and about the intraoperative rupture how to predict i don't know but there is many factors that we already know about if if it's acute aneurysm i mean if it's a rupture aneurysm and i'm operating it early enough within the first three days which is in general the one of the best uh, treatments you you are expecting high rate of intraoperative rupture that's why you you can see many intraoperative rupture videos in my series because i operate the patient early uh, uh, if, if you are operating on non-rupture aneurysm like the presentation of aneurysm it's not always rupture it's 50 50 let's say so sometimes it's unruptured it's only mass effect it's only third nerve palsy as a presentation of pcom aneurysm so if it's unruptured it's a total different story uh, when we when we are operating on ruptured aneurysm with the presentation acute and we are operating acute surgery within the first few days or hours this is a high there is a high risk of intraoperative rupture uh, all the other setting there is less risk and chance uh, to predict or not it's a total different idea um that's my answer is that enough for you or do you have an, uh, it, another yes idea? i think doctor so it's something like roughly predicted nothing like systematic or scoring system just uh, roughly we predict that I think that's the beautiful part of surgery that however you are doing outside literature studies, the intraoperative decision is still one of the major parts. Like with whatever you are preparing, like we are doing sometimes the 3D printing of the CT NGO of our patient to understand more what we will do inside and even to choose the clip prior to surgery, but it's not applicable always. Like these are more studies than an everyday life. Uh, yeah, my, my answer is that if you want to predict the intraoperative rupture, you need to study the steps that require. I don't mind. Let's have a look on this. If you are uh, ready, go through this and we can have a discussion at a later stage about what you find, because this is the operative operational steps. What I want you to think is that, yeah, is that solved or not? Do you have evidence about this step or not? This is very important. This, that's why I like your important like point. However, the next step is that you have a confirmation from me at least that, yeah, this is a good point to discuss. Then you go, to the literature to find if it's a defect in the literature or not. That's how we go to research. So go to the literature. I will I will help you with that, but this is what we want to do. Go to the literature, see what are the evidences and what's the exact definition that what you want exactly. You want to predict intraoperative rupture to do what and in what situations. That's, that's the importance. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Can I ask a question, Victor? The Mohammed Al Sandu. Okay. Um, I am introduced myself uh, before. So my question, uh, recording to Glasgow scale, if the patients, uh, it's. Uh, uh, Long term use uh, the bomb or any other anticonvulsant. That's may affect in the Glasgow coma skills and motors. And uh, in the other hand, if the patient has uh, attack and seizure in this in the same uh, time, that's effect. Yeah, definitely there is uh, many 
uh, contraindication and many cases affect the Glasgow. As you will give very good examples, I can add to you that if the patient has a cervical a spine injury and a quadriplegic, he cannot move any limb. If the patient, as we said before that, periorbital swelling, he cannot open his eyes, so it will affect the total number. If the patient has a small hematoma, let's say in a broca's area, so he will not able to talk. So he will be walking in the in the room and he have like lacunar infarction or lacunar hematoma, let's say focal injury in the Broca's area, you will see that, uh, yeah, this is not a, a perfect Glasgow. So factors affecting GCS is a very bored favorite topic. I would suggest to go through it, study it. I can give you resources through the group Later, just give me a reminder. But yeah, this, this is a topic that you want to go through. There is a huge uh, information that's very important. What I want to address today is that the situation that you will have, how important to have the GCS and the decision based on that. That's, that's a point. The other point, as you said, there is many exceptions. If you want to use the GCS on a daily basis, if you want to take decisions on GCS, you will know, you should know everything about it. That's why, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, yeah. There is many interesting conditions. I will send you some uh, resources. It will be very important. Thanks, Sita. You're welcome. Um, yeah, Mohammed, do you have a question, Mohammed Imara? No, thank you, Dr. Okay. Nicola, do you have a question? Yeah, I had one question. Uh, we just saw a ruptured aneurysm. And I was thinking like uh, when uh, there is too much blood uh, and maybe you can, clip the, you can clip the aneurysm, how can you define when to stop? Like uh, how can you understand when it's too late to save the patient and the patient is not going to make it? Yeah, that's uh, that's important question. The answer is that I think I answered it through the video in one way or an another that you don't have the time to think about what I feel or what what's the time I spend in this step because you are like, you are just a robotic action in this like, if it's not work, I will go to the temporary clip. If it's not work, I will go to this. And that's the importance to have a team. That's the, the importance to have a person that you trust, have also a good experience, maybe a, a different experience to have ideas. The one thing that I would uh, just address here, Nicola, if, if you think that you are the surgeon in this case, it's easy that you will miss some idea. It, it's easy that you will miss some one of the options. That's why there, there should be a team to suggest alternative. Like sometimes you will see in one of the videos later, I think and next Sunday, not, not tomorrow, the next or next Saturday, during one of the surgeries, which is challenging, I get like lost. I cannot control one of the bleedings. I just step out and ask my colleague, come on, and I will be the assistant. And I think I did that many times, sometimes elective, like, okay, I'm now controlling the lesion in, in, uh, in a good way. Let's make, let's be the assistant. So my, my, my assistant will be the surgeon, like changing the roles just because it's long surgeries. And sometimes you need everybody to be involved. However, in such example that I'm giving some of the surgeries, I cannot control the bleeding. I don't know why. I try everything, then I just stop. We flip, he starts as a surgeon. I'm the assistant. I cannot, see, I, I, I'm now out of the stress a little bit. I can see better, I can assist better. And in like two minutes, we control everything. So yeah, this is a continuous process of, uh, of uh, experience. This is, this is the exact surgical experience. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. I think that's the, the beauty of the surgery is that 
for a surgery, it's very uh, low percent of you cannot. And it's very low percent of our work that we follow the rule exactly. We, we follow the rule in a different way. Like what are the contraindications? Like the things that I should not do. Otherwise, I have the full authority to think and do things. When, whatever I like, it depends on my experience, my exposure. That this part of freedom of decision is, is the core of being a innovative surgeon of being a, the surgeon that bringing a new technique, new things, because there is this space. What are the contraindications? Let's say for craniotomy, don't make small size craniotomy for, uh, as the base of craniotomy, because there is a blood, there should be enough blood supply to the flap. However, whatever design you, you should choose, it's up to you. There is many suggested good design but it's up to you. If you go to some surgery like retrosigmoid surgery, every like every surgeon has his uh, idea about what's the best flap. It depends on his technique. What's the the tool he use? That's part of freedom during the surgical step is very important. And by the way, this I I didn't know this before. Like before I share my videos, I'm I'm just scared. Like. If I share my video, that, that's years ago, like maybe someone can say this is wrong. But with the time, with the experience, with, with the everyday discussions, that's getting in, in more and more clear. Like, wow, this is important. It depends on your experience. You can, you should defend your practice. That's the most important. And defend it based on the evidence that you, you study and the ev evidence that you have from the experience, whether personal experience or your previous experience during training. That's why I get back again, always to the fellowship or something like a focused training, because these times I have, like when I want to start operate aneurysm in my hospital, there is no one operating aneurysm before me. So all of a sudden, the decision that should I operate this patient with GCS9 or not, it's a huge decision. Nine can benefit from surgery or not. I, I don't know. What I know is that flashback from my training in Japan, we operate in nine. We don't operate in five or six in most of the instances. That's why I will operate in this patient. That is the answer. Like. Well, that's the difference between guideline and the experience, and we need both of them. Because at the end, you need to protect yourself in case of any complication. You need to show that you are sticking to the guideline. And at the same time, there are some decisions, we call it operational decision, or the decision that are taken based on the intraoperative finding. Okay, Nicola. Yes, doctor. Okay, uh, so uh, um, let's go to the next uh, step. But I I want to ask John if if we finish our time with with no. the surgical team. No, this is wonderful. Okay, this, thank this you. This is wonderful. I wish I was back in school. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I have a, a few things more. I think we don't need another uh, session outside Neurosurgical TV today, at least. Uh, let's uh, share uh, some uh, more just example of cases, short videos, and um, I'll show you now. If you have any question in mind, just ask. Um, I don't want more aneurysm, enough dose of aneurysm today. <laughs> and
So. I want to show you these things. Ah, I didn't show it yet. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I think with those will be just completion to the ideas. Uh, if you see my screen, my clear desktop, there is no documents. And... You can see your screen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can Please barely see. find anything. Yeah. So, uh, sorry. Um, let's see this. So basically this is a laminectomy. Yeah, laminectomy, even it's uh, my presentation. <laughs> and this is in the depth of the surgery. Do you notice what's, what's that lesion in the depth? Assist. Sorry. Assist. Cyst. Yeah. Actually, it's multiple cysts. I, I'm just showing you that this is multiple hydatid cyst of the spine. Many of these, you can see it's already ruptured cyst. Do you notice this? Because hydatid is common in the liver, common in, in, in the lung. So in that case, I remember this is just the de decompression for the spine, and in the in the wall, like this is like more retroperitoneal. You can see many other cysts. The patient body was filled with hydatid cyst, but yeah, you have many rupture, many are rupture. Just to give you an idea about, it's not always the large one. I'm I'm sorry if it's ah uh, yeah, like this is you can see the air going in and out. This is like part above diaphragm, opening to the thoracic area, and the thoracic area filled with high dotted cysts. So it's endless. I cannot follow all of them. It's just a a decompression. Uh, I want to show you this. Like this is a different setting. I want to show you two things. First is that from out, this is a spine also. And this is like, we are opening the spine from the back through laminectomy, opening the dura because we have the same dura in general. There's a specific difference, but in general, it's a dura. And you hold the dura opened. And do you see this? This is just the arachnoid similar to the brain. And this white area is the nerve roots. And for this patient, as I put above, like this is a spinal AVM. I want just to share with you the beauty of the anatomy. I cannot say the beauty of the lesion, but <laughs> like this is a challenging, this is a fascinating uh, structures to go through. The del delicacy, we are just now opening the arachnoid before starting any procedure and the stitch go through arachnoid. And the same thing that we say that we should have a sharp dissection always. Uh, most of the instances, this is called arachnoid splitting by holding the both sides is we use it more in the spine. And now you can see how, how the nerve root is pressed by those all surrounding vessel. Do you see how, how big this AVM? And the AVM of the spine is just different from the brain and the treatment, and we should go to the roots. I will go, youth, go with you through this, just the main part, how, how we dissect. And uh, yeah, you can see how the arteries, sorry, the AVM go with the, through the roots, with the root toward the spinal canal, to the spinal foramina. And our duty basically just to simplify things, to find the feeder. Usually there is a connection or a main feeder. We want to clip it uh, or we just cauterize it and cut it. We put a temporary clip. If, if it's okay and the patient in neuromonitoring not affected, we go and cut and cauterize and cut. So we don't leave clips in the spine. 
because there is no much space that it will cause compression to the uh, spinal cord, spinal roots. And yeah, like this is like dice dancing with devil because all the all the surrounding are just vessel and you are trying to find your way. You, you are trying to cut more and more arachnoid just to simplify the, the AVM. And this is just to give you an idea the end stage. Like, yeah, you can just after holding two main feeder, you can control all the other part. It's just simple. The difference from the brain that you are not obligate to remove all the AVM, it's totally different. It's more a disconnection surgery than resection surgery. But I want just to share it because this is a different anatomy, different setting. Nice to know that in neurosurgery we do this. And now I, I want to share because this is very important. Uh, for those who already attend surgery with me, they know that when when my colleague, the surgeon, is operating, I'm I'm usually looking to the screen and give instructions. In most of the cases, actually, the especially the last cases. So one of the things that I will instruct the student, our resident, to to focus on is that please don't focus only on what you see in the screen, like the things that you just see in the previous videos, but let's see together what are the condition of the surgeon during th those moments. Like this, if you imagine, yeah, this, this point, this is important for me. Like the surgeon is looking to the eye of, eye lens of microscope above. And do you see the hands? Do you see the instrument down in the field? Let's look back again to the depth of the field. So the things that you are just see it as easy that the clip is there, clipped, and the section is there. It's not that simple. When you see it from outside, when you are in the operating room, you will appreciate the, these details more because it's it's not easy. With 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 the added stress that we just described during the ruptures or things, and yeah, as always. Uh, there should be a discussion. Do you notice th the changing of instrument? How it happened? You ask for usually usually ask in advance, but you ask for things from time to time. Like I need this more. I need at least a pen instead of uh, a section device or a clip applicator. That's a very important aspect of the skills required or let's say a setting, it's not more about skills. And the thing is that this is the screen, this is the surgeon operating, this is one of my colleague. And I want to show you another, I want to show you another angle of the OR, which is the angle in the front of the screen. That this is Dr. Aufau, she's also a surgeon assisting. This is Dr. Haider assisting, I am assisting. This is Ahmed, he's a six year student. And I think those the two resident and student. And this is the imaging on the back we are discussing. And all of us just focusing on what he's doing millimeter by millimeter. Like, like we have a, a direct phone call with him. We are discussing everything through the procedure. That's how the, the teamwork or how that's how how the surgery went, just to give you an idea about the intraoperative or the operative atmosphere. Uh, yeah, so everybody see every detail and have an input, or if you have an idea, you can just put it if it's helpful. Otherwise, you are just distracting us. Um, the, th the, th the last thing I want to go through is that few CTs, uh, I will stop share first. If you have any question about those before going to the next thing, feel free to ask any question. It's it's not nothing repeated. It's always some some ideas you have in mind in the start. Then you change with the time. That's very important. Um. And this is the time you can share and 
somebody give you a little feedback, maybe not the best feedback, but at least there is a feedback. Uh, yeah, I will share. Now we have at least basics of CT scan. So I can go through some of these things. So what I did now is that I put, and this is for the first time, and this is just for you with this mentorship, is that I put part of my, let's say, uh, phone pictures during residencies, uh, during residency years, and I group it into groups, like 50-50 picture. So it contain like a snapshot of what the residency life is. This is very important because we can I, I can see through these pictures many stories behind every picture. So sometimes you need to remember that some cases like this is a bullet and you are happy you, you are getting the bullet out. Just put in mind, not all the bullets should be put out of the brain. You should not operate all the bullet just to get the bullet out because this is a common question for for student, for even for the patient and relative. Uh, like, would you remove the bullet? Sometimes I say no. Why? It, it's okay that it stay in the brain? Yeah, it's okay. It will be fibrosed around because it's very deep. It, it's nonsense to go and remove many brain just to get the bullet out. This is one idea. Another idea is that when you study the board, there is always board favorites. And fortunately enough, these are common in every place around the world. So what, just I'm giving you an example because there is many questions about the what are the resources. The answer is we are not in a college. We are in a medicine. We are in surgical field. So there is a huge number of references. There is, there is a huge number of textbooks. Uh, so don't search for, for the textbook that you already have, like for physiology, you can study on one, on one textbook for everything. It's not there in your neurosurgery. Actually, there is no book that you can study neurosurgery only in this book. There is, however, there is like Bible of neurosurgery. Everybody knows that Greenberg Handbook is the Bible of neurosurgery all over the world. Whenever you go, everybody is studying uh, uh, the handbook of Greenberg handbook of neurosurgery as part of the residency. So this is just important to put in mind. And from that, during residency, you want to go deep through the board favorite and through everyday cases. And from that, sometimes you, you search through literature, sometimes go through specific books about oncology, about vascular, and sometimes just to general textbook like humans. Uh, the the idea is that, like for example, in this, the pioneer region is one of the most common ask question in all exam. You know, I, I I did the Arabic board exam, I did the European exam, and I did the FRCS exam. So I think it's a huge part of the international exam. It's the it's the same always. The, there is a pineal, so you need some good text uh, to search for this usually came by suggestion. Like my advice is that you have many mentors. One of them should be a mentor of a study and or maybe more, more than one. That's what I did when I go to oncology. I ask my two mentors that's above me by one or two stage. When I, uh, I go through pineal in the, let's say, in the handbook, and it's very, very few about it. It's not detailed. Humans, it's very distracting. Can I go to somewhere to study? Yes, you can go to principal neurosurgery. Principal neurosurgery, you have the, the pineal and the uh, spinal bifida types, the, the meningosy, meningomyelocene, very well written there. You Like as a resident, as a surgeon, you want to go through that part. So this is what you will have in the neurosurgery. It's a topic-oriented study. It's never a book-oriented study. It's not a college. You will not say that this is from Cecil book. This is from Davidson book. It's not there. You should understand more about each disease and more, more focus on your daily work. And like what I should study, the answer is two things, board favorite and uh, everyday work because you need to focus on both of them. 
This is an example, teratoma versus glioma, germinoma, and pineoblastoma versus pineocytoma. This is very important to highlight. Just an example, any idea? This is not clear, definitely, but this is, uh, at least there is something, a study about the brain. Anybody, anybody raise hand, give me a suggestion what we are seeing. Taha, yes. Um, it's a mass. Space occupying lesion mass, definitely. Yeah. Next. What's uh, what's what you have in mind? Um, it's close to the cerebellum or like. Okay. So uh, don't 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 guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Osama, you, you have things in mind. Do you have an idea? Um, because could be a glioma. Could not. Uh, <laughs> could be, definitely could be. But the answer for me is could, could not. Uh, when you see a lesion like this, usually dumbbell, in a basically this is a corona section, and this is a lesion, a tumor, taking contrast, and this should be a cilia area or something like that, and there is a bulge from the cilia to above pushing the ventricle. So we are going to something about the pituitary. Okay? So it's not... Uh, just a mass and it's not a glioma only and if you like I, i'm going to help you more with this like this is the sagittal you can see there is two parts small part inside the cilia and large part above and if you go to the axial now by the way this is mri but it's not of difference now we are just describing where is the the lesion and yeah this is behind the orbit in the midline. So it's cilia, cilia with extension to the right side. There is a large extension to the right side and above. And also you can notice pushing the ventricle. Taha Osama, is that clear till now? Let's have a feedback yes. to have. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yes. so now it's, I can see that, yeah, it's a, a pituitary. And if I ask you a question, how can I treat this? Both of you, Taha and Um, We can exc excise the pituitary uh, adenoma through the nose by surgery. Try to be uh, nice with me. <laughs> give, uh, give me a term. Like we can excise like, the tumor. Oh, uh, okay, okay. I don't need to hear that. Give me a term. Like I'm asking how definitely I'm talking about surgery. Like if, if the, there is a medical treatment, especially if it's prolactinoma, if it's a whatever, but yeah. I like I'm I'm thinking more as a, a surgeon. If I want to go to this tumor and remove it, from where I should go? Let's from the nose. Make, exactly. Or um From, from, the the, nose, from the correct from the mouth, like from the nose, correct. From the mouth or no. orbit, orbit. From the orbit, you are doing savage. Like <laughs> this is a disaster. <laughs> I've heard that someone made it. <laughs> Other option. Uh, um, transphenoidal mm -hmm. hypophysectomy, maybe. Transphenoidal is is through the nose. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is a correct option. Another option. There should be another option, definitely. Like treatment without surgery. Management. Okay, and uh, like if, if this mass, if this big mass, and I can you don't, do a craniotomy. Uh, <laughs> a craniotomy. Wait, wait. If 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 this size mass, and still you are thinking not doing surgery, this means <laughs> that the patient cannot be operated. Like the patient is two hundred yeah. years and have all the disease in the, in the life. <laughs> yeah. Like this mass mandate something to do. Do you think there is uh, many diseases that in this size of mass can be treated with a drug only? There is, but it's very few. Uh, yeah, other than the nose, how can I get to this area? That's the question again, and a different perspective. Craniotomy? Definitely craniotomy. So yeah, the basic is that from the brain through craniotomy. However, with the advancement, they found the nose and found it very easy to remove. If you see from that point that if, do you see the slide? If I go through the nose, I can remove this, but this one is difficult, okay? So basically as 
as we we study that the pituitary tumor, and this is a, a, an example of pituitary adenoma. Pituitary adenoma should be treated transphenoidal in 95% of cases. For me, this is maybe one of the 5% that except if it has a huge extension away from the midline. Like this is frontal extension. How can you get from the nose? Because in the, from the nose, you will reach this area, the central area. But this large part, it will be difficult. Sometimes it's doable to pull it. Some, but for me, this is one of the contraindications for transphenoidal, just to give you an idea that the best to treat, this is a pituitary adenoma, number one. Number two, to have the sagittal coronal axial, to have all the idea. Number three is that there is another option except transphenoidal for pituitary is the transcranial. Uh, in some cases, one of the example is a huge extension from midline, either anterior, posterior, and mainly lateral extension. Uh, the good thing with pituitary adenoma, it's a benign lesion, and that's it. This is Dr. Uh, Saad Lutri. He's the founder of neurosurgery in Iraq. Actually, he's, he's the, the one that said to me during residency, because as, as you remember, we are going now during through residency time, but this is important for me. I put this book, it's very simple. It's just MCQ book, but the advantage of it is that a far-sighted book, that the only book in neurosurgery dedicated to subspecialty in neurosurgery, it's not a big deal, but it's unique. That's the advantage. And I, I was in like in the sixth, fifth year of residency, I write it in the sixth year published, and everybody, we are in Iraq at that time, everybody say, don't do it. Do your exam, be a surgeon, then publish any book. Other, otherwise, you will have a lot of problem. And it's not there. In general, everybody proud of you if you do it in the good way. And uh, this is just a, a snapshot from the back seat. What you see in the OR at the final outcome, what you see from the short videos, videos about the operative atmosphere, it comes from here. That this is one of the just simple room in the in the in the residence area. We put just tables, cheap microscope, demo uh, screen. Then we start make enter activity, inter-team activity, let's say, inter-resident activity. And we start from that point. And this is just an example of hot seat uh, exam that we put one of the younger resident inside, then we start questioning him. It's uh, something nice. It's very small place, but we put it a logo, we make it a different uh, courses. And the most important for every lab is not the facility, it's not the space, I, I'm always proud of this, and I will show you some good example about that. The most important thing in any lab is the dedication of people inside. You don't need only a teacher in lab. You need people that are interested in spite of the how busy the residency is, how busy you have outpatient, you have OR, you have you, you basically you don't have time. You but you make you should make time for the OR for the lab period, that's uh, the huge difference. Some residents will fight to have a few hours definitely each week in the lab. Others are just invited for courses. For me, as a skills, that's very important because I'm, I'm giving you example with minimum, like we don't have a lab, we don't have a microscope. Actually, we don't have a regular surgeon operating on microscope in my hospital during the sixth year of residency. And all of a sudden, once I am a surgeon, I'm doing only microsurgery. How I do it, how I did it from this. And the most important that I never did it alone. Like we are the, the surgeon after me by one year, then then other one, then the other one, all four and now five of us doing the same thing, working a team, all of us are microsurgeon. And we add to, the, to, to that, all of us are can do endovascular. And we don't learn this in residency. We learn in residency, the basics of neurosurgery and how to treat the difficult craniotomies, bleedings. Then to add this advancement, it's easy. 
the opposite is not there. Like if you if you are not good in basics, you cannot advance more. That's what what I'm thankful for the residency program. However, it's simple, but it's very helpful that you have a good base, a knowledge base, study base, practice base, because you don't need the surgeon that you don't study well. And you don't need the surgeon that only study and do not operate much. You need, as during residency, you need to operate many as many as possible surgeries because this is a building experience at the same time you should have you should force yourself to have the theoretical knowledge you need both of them and how much you you uh, uh, have uh, like put your time on both of them is the end result my suggestion is that the alternation because i i from my experience i i should always remember you that this is not the typical maybe, but I'm sharing mine and just to make you think that my experience is that I spent maybe three or four months straight only doing surgery. I cannot study anything. Then later I, I change into an, another team. Let's say uh, we can operate, we operate less. So I go and do more and more uh, studying. So time for study few months focusing more on surgery, few months focusing more on, on uh, 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 studying. That, that's, I think, very important. This is a scratch from me or what? Yeah. Someone uh, to annotate on the screen, it's not my. Oh, okay. So this is just to remind you that sometimes we receive this and we have two options, either you complain or we go by ourselves to the radiology department, have discussion and take more good picture for us because you we, you have a common aneurysm here and the picture is going very far. I need to see the aneurysm more. It's a common carotid. It's the internal carotid there. And this is the middle cerebral. This is the anterior. And the other anterior is not there. Anybody has an idea is why it's not there? This is the carotid, this is the middle cerebral, and the anterior cerebral is not there. Why the anterior cerebral here is absent? Um, could be an occlusion. Oh, I, I hear the atritic from Taha. What's your answer, Osama? Um, I was saying maybe there's an occlusion over there. Yeah, definitely it's uh, two possibilities are there, but for like with the time you will learn this, that usually in most instances that I cannot give a person, I don't have it in my mind now, but I can say it's very high percent that the anterior cerebral artery are not equal. Someone we call it dominant, the other we call it hypoplastic, especially in cases of, of aneurysms. So this absence of artery in CT and geography reconstruction doesn't mean it's really absent. And by the way, in most instances, doesn't really mean it's blocked. So inside the surgery, I will sh show you this when we have example of ICOM that one, uh, one side is very large anterior cerebral. We call this A1 before the um, intercommunicating. And the other A1 is just hypoplastic. It's not seen in CTA. It's seen in traop, but this means it's not big enough. And... Is that an important thing to, to have in mind? The answer is yes, because I would prefer to do the surgery with the side of dominant A1. This is one of the rules. When, because ACOM is, is the, in the middle, should I operate from this side or, or from this side? There is criteria. One of the criteria is that if you have a dominant A1, so try to operate from that side. Any idea why? The answer is the answer. Yeah, Nicole. Yeah. Who's who's want, who want to answer? Um, Dr. Shami from Bangladesh. Yeah, Dr. Shami. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. And so what's your answer? Uh, to control the vessel. Sorry? To control the vessel. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Control because, the 
the control, because th that's the point that I want to raise here. One of the most important pr principles during aneurysm surgery is to have the proximal control. This is the golden term. Proximal control make you sa safe. So if I go from this side, I have the control on A1. In case of any rupture, I have the A1 in my side. I can control it easy. So thank you, Dr. Shemi. Yes, it's the, it's the control. And by the way, what's this? This is vertebral, and this is the other vertebral, and this is basilar, PCA. At the same time, you can see a similar example in the vertebrals. One is big, one is smaller. Actually, it's not absent. The vertebral usually asymmetrical with the, which one usually larger of the vertebral? Anyone has any idea? Uh, like these are variation, but these are common variation. Something just to have in mind. Like usually you have left vertebral art, uh, artery larger than the right vertebral artery and up to 60%, five, 50 to 60%, the left, the left vertebral artery is the larger, okay? And like 20%, it's both of them equal and the other is the right. So when you think about the vertebral, because some people can say that the vertebral is stenosis, no, if it's right, so usually it's the normal variation that the left is the larger, just simply, simply asymmetrical. Uh, you need to, to rethink about your pathway from time to time, having self-improvement book, having self-improvement self videos. Again, this is a snapshot of residency period, just to have an idea, like you need this, uh, you need to think about yourself, how to improve it. The, here, just an interesting example, like these are one of the devices that are suggested to remove deep intracerebral hematoma, you can use just some something like tube and go directly to, to the hematoma and remove it rather than do a huge opening in the in the brain. So this is one of the suggestion, but in that example, I think this is in a course in it in Italy, in Naples. And uh, it was a Japanese edition as usual. It's a different thing and interesting. And they suggest to put a simulator for training and they based on coffee and uh, uh, they use a smashed potato to simulate the brain and the coffee to simulate the hematoma and put it in a like a cup similar to the head and then try this the the thing that i show you the tubes to simulate how we do endoscopic removal of the ich through very small opening that's very advanced it's now used in many parts all over the world. We call it the minimally invasive ICH resection. It's very important and it increased the, the amount of ICH or the, the number of ICH cases that we treat. And yeah, that's memory from that course. Um, this is one of the most important signs in residency that uh, you will hear it like, thousands of times, the ice cream cone sign. This is very specific to this lesion. Um, if I can ask Taha, uh, what do you think that this part of the brain, if it's ventricle, which, which part of the ventricle? Um, the fourth ventricle. Perfect. So the brain stem will be anterior. I need only the fourth ventricle to give to give us orientation. So this is the brain stem. This is cerebellum. This mm. is the fourth ventricle, and the angle between the cerebellum and the brain stem, which which is the pons in this example, the angle between them we call the cerebellopontine angle, which is very famous space in neurosurgery because we study the CPA a lot, we call it cerebellopontine angle CPA. And the most important lesion here, uh, the most common lesion is the vestibular schwannoma. Another name is acoustic neuroma, up to 80% from CPA lesion. And this is a tumor just in this space and originate down from the internal auditory canal. So the cone part is within the internal auditory canal and the outer part in the subarachnoid space in the CPA. This gives this classic example of the ice cream on consign of vestibular schwannoma. This is just an alarm for you. 
try to study the vestibular schwannoma, try to study the CPA. It's one of the most board favorite examples for operative, for, for basics. And I want just to give an, a radiological point here. How I can confirm this is pons? Give me suggestions, anybody. Why this is pons? One, uh, two, basilar artery, perfect. Basilar artery, if it's sent, if it's just in the front, basilar, if it's two vertebral, so it's a pon, it's medulla. If only basilar, it's a pons. If nothing, so it may be midbrain. So basal artery, one of the signs that this part of midbrain is the middle part, which is the pons. Another suggestion that this is the pons. Is it the Mickey Mouse shape? No. <laughs> Before I continue, no. <laughs> yeah, I have like a, a, an enumeration in my mind. Yeah, first basal artery in front, second, the widest, the widest section of the fourth ventricle behind. So the fourth ventricle will be the largest section behind the points directly. So basilar in front, fourth ventricle large behind. This is number two. Number three. And I, I think the third, the wide section of cerebellum. Mm, perfect, uh, except something uh, the like- The middle cerebellum, uh, Yeah. That, that's perfect. The the as as you said, the white section of cerebellum peduncle, because this is the middle cerebellar peduncle. This is the only peduncle that can be seen in everything, CT, MRI, whatever, and it's very thick. So the section it's connect the pons with the cerebellum, while the superior cerebellar peduncle connect the midbrain with cerebellum, the inferior cerebellar peduncle connect the medulla oblongata with the cerebellum. This is not important. The most important is that the pons is connected to the cerebellum through very thick middle cerebellar peduncle. So now I think you can swear that this is bones because middle cerebellar ventricle, large fourth ventricle, basilar artery in the front. Okay, that that's how we study the radiology. That's how we increase our knowledge. Every time you focus and more, that's the importance of discussions. And with with residency, you should go like ring enhancing lesion. Basically, it's either the glioma or abscess. But with the time, you need more and more mnemonics, details. Everybody suggests different classification. This is part of the residency. You know more differential diagnosis about each one. My advice at this point, please keep a priority. When you are asked about a ring enhancing lesion and you, you start with thrombose giant aneurysm, this is the recipe of disaster. We will start the disaster now. It's not an exam. So keep in mind like the priority first. I should answer that maybe tumor, mostly glioma, maybe secondary, or maybe abscess. It depends on the surrounding edema, depend on the history, depend on the age. That, that's the usual answer for exam. If they want more differential, yeah, I have this in mind to go through other differential. Is that clear? I think now you get the point of these slides that the, I, I told you, I, I, I would call it snapshot of residencies uh, or snapshot shots of residency. Uh, this is for the first time, but this is my feeling that this is what sh should be shared with the student and those will start the, the residency soon, that how will be the life for me as a, as, as, as a resident and the important question how it's different from uh, the pre-residency area, how we study deep, how we go to, to get this uh, training, this knowledge. I think that give you some idea, at least from my uh, experience, which is not big, but, uh, but uh, this is, let's say, this is the spark, the start. And I think you can get more and more from many, many neurosurgeons around the world. They are all happy to have. For me, the meaning of this slide, this is Osborne Radiology, one of the best book in radiology. I think it's proved all over the world that Osborne is, is one of the best books that you can study radiology during residency. The idea is this book is this table. Like it, it's not only radiology, it summarizes 
the disease for you. So you, so when you are studying radiology, you are studying your your diseases at the same time. Maybe the management is not good in Osborne, but I want to flag this. This is one of the good resources. Um, yeah, this is I think with the after first uh, after two years in residency, this will be starting in your mind how to design, how to orient yourself. Like what are the possible approaches? Where I can go with this approach? What are the limits? And at the same time on the opposite way, if, if I have let's an example, the posterior cerebral artery, how I can get to the first part, the second part, third part, what are the angle? What are the name of crazy approaches? What are the name of the standard approaches? This is very important from operative part and it will be target. Like if, if I can test like residents, even me when I'm resident, that can you draw this for me for I, I for the transcendent approach, pretemporal approach, septemporal approach, and posterior interhemispheric approach. Can you draw this on the brain and give me exactly what's the segment of artery that I can reach? The answer, I think, in the majority, I cannot be such a precise. That's why we, we should study this more and more. And I think with the final year of residency, you will think more of specialization, and this will be helpful like to study the vessels more or, or to study the mechanics. If I am interested in spine, the spine is the art of, to, of mechanics, how to understand the sagittal balance, the coronal balance. I cannot give more example. That's my limit in the spine, but this is just an idea. Um, the big image, the zoom out image, you are responsible for the all the extracranial vessels, whether arteries, vein, extracranial, equally important to intracranial. When you are fully oriented in extracranial supply, any bleeding from the scalp, from the bone, it's easy to manage because you have the, let's say the anatomical map. So the importance is equal. You, you should go with the anterior cerebral five branches. Where is the A1? Where is the A2? Where is the A3? Go deep with these, the courses, the divisions, but at the same time, think out. It's not out of, out of the books. Think on the cover of the books and what are the extracranial anatomy related. My usual test for any new uh, person in residency is that can you enumerate the 15 or 17 branch of the maxillary artery. That's my like test of knowledge, just to, to give them an idea. Wow, there is an artery just below the skull and have 15 branch and I know maybe five or six. This is the average. When I test people, the average is five or six. So this is an important message. Uh, yeah, I'm... I'm um, I want to want to describe uh, any person new want to describe this CT scan. I feel I, I'm I'm exhausting those people. However, I like the, their answers. Um, yeah, go. Uh, yeah, ta. Um, maybe it's edema. Okay, that's correct. End of exam. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah, the, the first impression is good. Let's uh, uh, let's uh, teach you how to do it in the let's say in the final exam of your board. Let's say, I I would say the following. This is the name and age of patient. This is axial CT scan and coronal and sagittal of the brain showing a, a left frontal uh, hypodense lesion surrounding a, a, a rounded isodense frontal lesion. It's more intraaxial, it's not extraaxial lesion. The size is about two centimeter. Done. Okay. All the other are normal. Ventricle normal, edema is just, I, I describe it as focal edema, as you said. That's why I said correct. So there is a lesion and there is edema. Definitely you can see the edema before the lesion. But when there is a, an edema, you should ask where yes, is the lesion. Yeah. One yeah. important question is that 
I should ask Taha again. Why this is edema? Why not ischemia? Um, because ischemia is you know confined to an area, like of okay. an artery. Okay, but but and I edema answer... is associated with a mass. No, 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 no. When you answer, you put priority. The, yeah. the ischemia associated with area of arteries. That's perfect for anterior, for middle, for posterior arteries. These are like ICA, PICA. These are territorial. However, if if it's let's say it's a lacunar infarction, a small infarction. Um, an edema is like a finger light projection. Perfect. That's. Do you see the star? This this is star. Yeah. This is the, this is the perfect. I will put it in a three term. These are very very important for neurology, for neurosurgery, for pre residency, for medical student. That if you see a dark area. If it's ischemia, it should be confined to the to an area of the brain. However, it must include the cortex. Is there any ischemia that doesn't include the cortex? Yes, it will be lacunar infarction, just a small area. This is number one. Number two, if this is a brain edema, what are the features? Feature number one, it will be star shape, which means a finger-like projection. We describe it as a finger. And the most important, this area, what's this area? We call it cortical sparing. And I think now you can understand what we mean by cortical sparing. Cortical sparing, which means that there is some area of the cortex is spared, and this is 100% an edema. If it's ischemia, it will, it will start from the surface, okay? And you can find the cortical sparing as an answer of many questions for the board exams. This is important. And after that, yeah, you can go and where is the lesion that causing this, such edema? Maybe this one. Good till now, let's go to more imaging of this patient. This is your answer. This is a flare MRI. I don't want to go through MRI today. This is the CT today. So this is an edema. Then we take contrast. GADO is the contrast for MRI. And you can see the lesion now better. I can think. Like this is the one view of MRI, Taha, and this is the other view. And now you can see the beauty of MRI. MRI when you can play with the lesion according to its density and characteristic. So this one show you how, what's the extent of edema. And this one show you the lesion only without edema. So because the edema, it's there, you can see it. The edema is there surrounding the lesion, but edema doesn't take contrast. That's okay. So now we can see the lesion. The lesion take contrast. So if I put a differential diagnosis, anybody can help us with this. If I want to put a differential diagnosis for that, I would put number one, like a lesion with edema and the lesion taking contrast. I should put a tumor. I will not wait for that answer. I should put a tumor. And if I ask, what's the tumor? That's the question. Do you think it's a primary or secondary? And what's the difference between them? For a primary tumor, I'm trying to answer this just to make you more saving this and make it recorded. Uh, the, the first one, the primary tumor usually characterized by having a larger size and less edema, while the secondary tumor having a small size with, with larger edema. Just save this. And this is applied for the abscess also. So abscess has a feature similar to secondary tumor, or let's 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 say the the, the abscess and malignant tumor secondary metastases uh, have this thing in common that they are usually small lesion with very huge edema, actually triple this size. That's one of the feature. And while the benign primary usually occur as a very large tumor and very small surrounding edema. For this, I cannot say. For this, this is just in the middle. Like this is the lesion and this is the edema. I cannot say. Intraoperatively, it's just simple. This is the lesion. When we go inside, the, we go to this. This is the cortex, this is the bulging. The, do you see the brain, how it's bulged? This is the answer of edema. This is the meaning of edema. Edema means the brain is angry and swell, but it's local. So you can see the other brain part are normal. Only this part is bulging. Do you see it, Taha? Yeah, yeah, I do. 
Okay, and and the tumor is very clear. We just dis dissect it and bye bye. That's it. There is no vascularity. It's very simple. That's the difference between I can spend two hours more in the radiology of this patient, but we need to remove it at the end. So just to give you an example that the radiology is important. However, it's if, if I was thinking only on radiology and I I I should I may get wrong. So try to give things as a percent. Radiology important and intraoperative finding may be different. That's the lesson from this image that I think this is not related to this image. Like uh, here may be a significantly malignant, but intraoperatively it was very benign, less vascular and histopathology, like denote a benign a grade one uh, um, ganglioglioma. Uh, if, if I remember exactly, I'm not the tumor guy, by the way. So just give just an example. Uh, what I want to say now, what's the good in this surgery? And I'm proud of this one of the residency surgeries, but I'm proud of this cut. Do you, I want you to think that the, the surgery, the, the opening of the skull is good or not? How I can measure this is a good opening or not? Good craniotomy location or not? Good, good craniotomy positioning or not? The answer is that if you center the lesion inside the, the craniotomy, that's the good. And now you can see it is centered and also all the surrounding that I need during the surgery, it's there. So it's very, very good. And if you know that this case was done without navigation, you can understand my point here is that you should relate the CT scan with the patient head, use sutures, use the ear, use the eye, just to localize the, the lesion and to make your surgery perfect and perfect with time. That's what we, you will learn in the residency. You can operate on extra dura hematoma from the second year, but actually it's up to the fourth year when you will be having a perfect craniotomy just above the full hematoma. That's how you will learn in residency that how to do the surgery more perfect. This angle of perfection usually hidden outside the residency. I'm now trying to expose that, that, that those details are very important. When you have a good resident, have a good anatomical orientation, this is the sign. When you have a disoriented resident, you will see later, I will show you some example that this is the large craniotomy and the tumor is just in the side. Um, I think that's it. I, I don't want to go more. That's very uh, enough for today. We have many things to go through. I hope this is interesting till now. Um, I'm ready to go, to take a few comment and question, then get uh, to the end of this, and thank you for your time. I think you spent oh three and a half hours. I hope that was a little bit useful. Yeah, if you have a comment, I, I'm I'm and or a question. Yeah, Sam. Oh, sorry, I didn't lower my hand. <laughs> yeah, you forget your hand up. <laughs> and Nicola also, so he get his hand down. Any question? Any comment? Yeah, Tiba. Uh, Dr. Ross, there is a question in the Q&A section uh, by Jeremy, if you can check it out. It was after the aneurysm uh, operation video. About, about? Well, uh, he asked first, is there a point where you don't go for aneurysm when, within the first three days? Because in their hospital in Kenya, since the clips are not available in the hospital, we don't sometimes operate on our patients immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It depends. Like, uh, no, uh, uh, I, I think I, I described this early uh, in the previous meeting that the indication of surgery, part of indication of surgery, is the availability and the guideline of local institute. So it, it's not always a scientific decision. Sometimes, basically, you don't have the facility. If I, if I don't have an operating microscope or my, my, my microscope today is not working, I will not sacrifice this patient with, with a gross surgery. So either I shift the patient to another 
hospital if it's possible, or I, I wait until I have an option. So it's quite flexible. Definitely it's quite flexible. Uh, yeah, I, the answer is there is no correct or wrong uh, answer. There is always the maximum possible treatment. That's our target with our patient. What's the maximum in your hospital in that moment? And just to give you an idea, I, I remember one of the questions in one of my international exams, like they asked me if you, have, if you came the next day and you find something wrong with the decision, would you tell the family or not? I would, the answer, the typical answer was, I would tell the family, okay? But I would say that I don't know the situation at the moment they take decision. And this is the truth. This is just for you to keep it in mind that, yeah, I, I can't judge uh, Tiba is doing a wrong decision. I would operate this. It's easy online. But if you, if, you, if you are the person involved, you have a, maybe a different perspective or different idea. But it's nice at the end to discuss this from because there is a next time. There is a next patient. So better for all of us to discuss all the options. Yeah, if any other question? Uh, there is another question. Uh, he said, would you advise on the use of cadaver labs to learn the approaches to aneurysms and how easy it is to obtain fellowships in your vascular surgery in your center, especially in middle income countries? Uh, there is no unified answer for that. Definitely it's a target. Uh, anatomy is the most important whenever, like for me, one of my major assists till now, like my full confidence in the anatomy and I'm, I'm learning anatomy every day, but my college study of anatomy was very good. And my early interest of anatomy, especially in cadaver, and if you go now to the to my just YouTube channel, you can see at least there is uh, maybe 100 or 70 videos from cadaver that I dissect during anatomy, during the college. I am teaching anatomy just it's like not the formal teaching. I'm one of the students in the last years. I go back to the lab, anatomy cadaver lab, and I dissect cadaver. And we have a full recording. I think the full body anatomy on cadavers. That's very important. I think that's one of the advices that I can give for you is that it's not about anatomy. Is that find something in the, in the college to have it as a, one of the strongest, your strongest point. For me, I depend on anatomy in everything. My understanding for radiology, my surgery, it's on anatomy. And I think there is a, a quote, I sometimes use it in my presentations, is that the surgery equal to anatomy plus hemostasis. And this is what you what you see in the, in the videos that hemostasis is a major part in surgery. If you can stop any bleeding type, that's very important. So anatomy plus hemostasis is the, is the exact definition of surgery. Uh, that, that's the answer uh, for the second part. For, so yeah, uh, try to uh, explore any uh, any possibility and it depends on your preparation. Like you, you will not get fellowship because you are a resident in somewhere. This is not advantage. There is thousands of residents. You are, you are not get fellowship because you are interested in vascular. There is thousands interested in vascular. If you show something in your CV that you are caring about some specialty, this is one of the most uh, important advantages that you will have in the future. If I see a CV for a student doing three research about functional neurosurgery, that's a big wow. This is a consistent work. It's totally different from doing a paper on hypertension, paper on supratentorial approaches. Oh, what's this? This is just exploring uh, the branches as, as we discussed before. So this is a normal, this is a regular, but having a person focusing on anatomy of vascular, focusing on something of vascular, a workshop in vascular, 
this CV will be very suggestive to get future. I think the world, I get my fellowship in Japan from the World Federation of Neurosurgery. It's a free and even they give me an extra salary and one of the best experience. Uh, I think it's available for everybody at the final year of residency and the first three years after graduation. So if, if you are in this stage, but you should plan it at least one year before. So if you are in the middle of residency, apply one of, for one of the World Federation of Neurosurgery Fellowship. And I think in the exam, in the question, in the question you mentioned that this one is uh, uh, in limited resources, maybe. This fellowship is just for people with limited resources. Um, that's it. I think we should have many questions more. We will um, take it later. Uh, I think for time, it's maximum now. Thank you for your time. Thank you, John, for being there. And thank you, everybody, for this interaction. And thank you, Dr. Takeshi. Because I see you now. <laughs> the next webcast is Tuesday, Summer? Uh, Tuesday, then, uh, no, Sunday, Tuesday. Oh, Sunday, or oh, tomorrow? Yeah. yeah. Oh, tomorrow, oh, we'll we'll, we'll tomorrow, tomorrow is the research day. So it's to, the totally different. Uh, oh, okay, it's not televised tomorrow. N if, if we can, better. It depends on your schedule. Yeah, okay, we'll talk about it later. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you for being patient and listening to all of that. I hope it's helpful. And yeah, see you, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.